And um, while everybody's gathering, um, Tyson, thank you. Taria, thank you. Um, and I, I wanted to, um, I'll start my questions until I hear from Douglas that the people who had raised their hands are back. Okay, Douglas, you'll let me know, or are they back? Um, it's no way for us to tell for sure, but they appear to be back. Okay, well then let's go to public comment first and then I have some wrap up comments. So Justin, will you please call the public comment? Thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, mm -hmm. Up first, we have Bill Higgins. Um, good afternoon, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you. I'm Bill Higgins and I represent the California Association of Councils of Governments which represents all um, regional transportation planning agencies statewide and all MPOs re responsible for implementing SB 375. And we have um, our members up and down the state who are actively engaged in implementing and planning for electric vehicles. So I'm very excited about um, everything that was shared today. I do want to raise an issue that has not been talked today that I think what we do have to put on our system, and that's the fiscal resilience of the transportation system. We saw a video today where somebody was very happy because she didn't have to pay gasoline tax, or gas, pay for gasoline, which means she's also not paying for the gasoline tax to maintain the roads and bridges and transit systems that, mo that money is being used for. And I think that as we transition, it's incumbent on all of us to think about how we're going to rebuild our transportation funding system. The Mineta Institute has a study out that, re that recognizes that we could, because of EVs and other things, we could see a billion dollar shortfall by, as much, by 2030 and as many as $4 billion a year shortfall by 2040. And so we want to engage that conversation with you. How do we still maintain the system? You want many of our members to implement SCSs that will achieve further reductions, and they're implementing strategies that are based on forecasted gasoline revenues that may not be there now in 2035. So I want to just put a flag in that issue and say, let's talk about it and plan for it as we switch to electric vehicles and engage in this process, we also need to think about our, our funding resilience. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, but um, we're, we're in the middle of um, Tyson um, trying to respond to a, a tough question, which was one of mine, as he knows. So oh, great. Um, and, um, and if I, depending on what Tyson said, if I can supplement that by what's in Senate Bill 1 relative to EV fees, Maybe not adequate, but at least it's in there. I'd be happy to. Otherwise, I'll put myself back on mute, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'll call on you after Tyson has an opportunity to respond. And so, yeah, <clears throat> not a whole lot to add, is, except that we need to. We do need to focus on this. We need to create a sustainable, an economically sustainable system that includes the whole transportation infrastructure that enables all of us to do the things we want to do and get the goods that we we want. And so, I think. It's absolutely something that you know. I think we're committed. Like in the, if you look at the ZEV strategy, you know, it's called out in the well, the CTC's action plan, and uh, I know Caltrans thinks about this, and and Calsta, and so like all the transportation agencies. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely an issue. So I, I wish I had something more insightful to say, but you know, like they looking at kind of what the road charge goes, or you know, BMT fees. I think we heard some interesting discussion today. You know, even just the impact of, on lower income communities or priority communities mm -hmm. for like a VMT type of approach. And so it's, this is definitely something we need to focus in on. Absolutely. And now, um, thank you, Tyson. And now, uh, Commissioner Gordino, do you want to add some commentary to that? Happy to do so. So let me just start by saying the speaker's comments are, are, are spot on. And it's something we have to address. Senate Bill 1, did address that to some extent. It's not quite um, um, uh, enough, but I think it was roughly 100 to $120 a year for electric vehicle owners to help continue to pay for these uh, transportation systems that SB1 is trying to fund. Tyson may know the exact amount, and again, it may not be quite the um, the 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 exact handoff, but it was something in the bill. 
I, I do know that the Mineta Institute took those fees into account when they identified their uh, funding shortfall. Great, thank, thank you. you for that. Could you um, possibly uh, build, uh, link us up to the Mineta Institute report uh, so that we can make that available for those who are listening? Uh, and I, will do, uh, I will do that. Okay, wonderful. Um, and uh, Taria, I know that you have to leave at, 1230. So my comments were to you. So I want to catch you while you have 10 minutes. First, I want to say what a fantastic presentation you gave. And especially for slide two, when you showed the slave ship, I think there's a difference between being silent and being speechless. And I think many of us were just speechless at the profound statement that you made in association with that slide. And what I would like to ask on behalf of everybody who's going to be accessing your presentation without the benefit of your wise words, whether or not you would um, take the time to maybe write down in a paragraph what you what you said in relation to that slide so that people could take that time and be educated and really hear your wisdom in relation to, to the point you were making, because it was really a strong one. And I think it would be helpful to have people have the benefit of your words as well as the slide itself. Sure. Um, yeah, I can. I I wrote out what I was going to say, so I can copy and paste that very easily. Um, I think I'll just check in with Bridget on how to give an up, updated set of slides with notes because um, I know I had a lot of pictures and stuff too. So I can that add my fantastic. notes. That would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. And I wanted to ask you a question because it's something that. Um, we're all exploring, and that is about access to EVs and whether or not um, you're also exploring whether people want access in terms of ownership or there's the possibility of access in terms of being able to car share an EV or ride in an EV, especially as we're coming back from COVID and people are still trying to figure out how to pay the rent and their mortgage and everyone is fiscally constrained. Are you thinking about how to present a, a variety of access points to EVs? And um, then I wanted to also ask you about um, the aftermarket and how we should be looking at what the aftermarket could do to contribute to access to EVs. Um, so for the first question, um, definitely it's, it's, it's hard to balance because especially in communities of color, car ownership is a form of wealth. So car ownership is really important for some uh, families because it's, you know, if we go back in history, it's kind of the only way that you could build wealth. Um, one of the only ways to build wealth is because of the lack of access to uh, mortgages. Um, so we're, we have that history and, and somewhat present uh, problem. Uh, to contend with. Um, so, it, but then on the flip side, we're, we don't want folks to go into more debt just to get a vehicle. Um, so if by aftermarket, you're talking about um, pre-owned vehicles, um, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, that yes. is something um, that is something that we are very excited about with all of the new vehicles that are coming online. Um, so in Erica's case, um, so she had the BMW i3, those are going for less, I've seen some for $8,000, all, you know, all the way up to brand new ones that are um, in the $30,000 range. So we have models that are definitely, um, you know, they, their battery technology might be a little bit older, so their range might not be the best, um, but definitely uh, doing those, somewhat intimate needs assessments with folks and say like, are you driving 100 miles a day? Or are you driving like 20 miles a day? Because this range is completely fine for you if this is a you know, you know, 150 mile range vehicle. So education around range anxiety to reduce range anxiety is definitely important. Um, shared mobility, so car ownership is important for some families. Uh, shared mobility, um, I think for folks that aren't familiar with Green Red Terros, um, this is an amazing uh, version of how resilient communities, we can leverage resiliency within communities and just fund that resiliency. <laughs> like they created a shared mobility program themselves and then 
were able to just fund what they had already created as a form of resiliency and really uplift that. As that's a program right there, why are we gonna try to create another one? Um, so I'd love to see more programs like that come online, especially for communities that don't have incredible mayors like uh, Mayor Ray de Leon. You know, we have communities that may not have such strong voices that can navigate uh, you know, navigate state government and understand how to get into the, to the correct meetings uh, to receive funding. So how can we do that work from our side too and recognize that there's a lot of people, you know, just from my experience in my family, like they're living in multi-unit dwellings. There is that one person that has a car that will leverage it to pick up groceries for a grandma, uh, take some kids to school, pick up kids from activities. So there's forms of resiliency that are already happening. How do we uplift those? Um, a lot of the program incentives, especially CVA, I, I believe it's CVAP as well as CVRP, are giving incentives for e-bikes as well. So uh, these incentives having multiple ways to leverage the funds for public transportation, if that's, mm -hmm. if we want to scrap this car and get public transportation for our children to be able to leverage that, um, and or, or, or get an e-bike. But I think in all of these conversations, we're really talking about movement of people. We're talking about mobility. So recognizing that e-bikes are great, but studies have shown, um, you know, black men specifically are more likely to be pulled over as a pedestrian, even on a bike. Um, and a lot of black men are um, using bikes as a form of transportation because of their inability to buy a car or their inability to get a license. Um, coming uh, as a re as a returning citizen uh, from from prison, so we can create systems and great ways to keep from you know greening our traffic, um, but also we have to recognize that some people move and navigate and uh, get to and from places in a way that uh, carries a much larger burden than some folks. So how do we bring that into the conversation as well? Um, aftermarket folks in the Central Valley, our, our uh, partners at Valley Air, especially CCAC, are really focused on uh, pre-owned uh, electric vehicles because we recognize that's really where we can start giving out free cars because these incentive amounts, when you stack them together, we can get up to $15,000 for a person uh, for a vehicle. So then we start becoming like Oprah and saying, you get a free car, you don't have to go into debt. All of yeah. this incentive is cash on the hood. We have, um, uh, what is it, uh, clean fuel standard? Or there's an, there's another program that's coming on. It's $1,000 cash on the hood no matter who it is. And it's unfortunately a still four new cars, but seeing a program like that move into four new uh, for pre-owned vehicles would be great too because then we're just stacking all these programs together and being able to give uh, free cars to people, uh, free forms of mobility to people, getting $8,000 to use BART from Clean Cars for All uh, Bay Area, that's incredible. That's a lot of public transportation use and leveraging the fact that we have clipper cards that work on buses, multiple forms of mobility is incredible. So we have the infrastructure, it's just coordinating enough to make sure that the end user is taking advantage of all of them to really get uh, you know, get all of the money they deserve and leverage it to get the mobility they need. Well, thank you so much for that very thorough answer and for your really wonderful presentation, really grounding this in, in a real lived experience. Really appreciate it. Um, and Tyson, my last question, and we'll go back to public comment, was about um, the, the issue about how you're, you and the PUC are looking at electricity as a fuel and the pricing related to that, that may be different than the, the charging for electricity as um, using just as a utility. And what you're thinking as, you know, Bill Higgins correctly pointed out about how we're gonna transition from a gas tax to a road user charge and a VMT fee, how we can look at what we're gonna be doing to, to make sure that there's no loss of funding, especially when SB1 funds are so, counted on throughout the state to, to handle infrastructure needs. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that question. I think the, the rates question, I mean, the Public Utilities Commission is, has, you know, big 
stream of work on on rates and trying to enable adoption, working closely with utilities, you know, managing demand charges. I mean, it's it's an interesting. There's an intersection point with uh, throughput where you like know, the kind of the traditional demand charge based system actually is is um, beneficial to the customer and as far as driving out price so it's, it's figuring out that there's a cost to the system and somebody has to pay for it and how do we do that you know it's kind of like a push pull or a ball of yarn type of approach and I think Chair Randolph you probably have a lot a lot of insight there too through the <laughs> your previous role um, and then uh, so I think there's there's a lot there in terms of the you know the taxes and everything I mean it's um, it, it's a complicated thing to untangle, especially if you look at the, you know, different uh, collection points. I mean, even on the hydrogen side, we don't have really strong guidance on what the um, tax structure would be on the fuel, right? So right now it's the sales tax is what is charged. There's no other, you know, so that it's, um, this is all kind of new frontier type of stuff that we need to be thinking through and like, what is fair to the, to the end user and how do we still the balancing that really pushing adoption, giving clear benefits, you know, compared to internal combustion in the early market. And then while we're phasing in, you know, so there's, it's still always an advantage, not just an environmental advantage, but an economic advantage to drive electric, you yeah. know, fuel cell or battery. And so, yeah. Can I just, can I just uh, respond a moment on the, the uh, electricity, electricity is fuel uh, point. Oh, yeah. as, Tyson, as Tyson points out, I have a point of view on this. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I think the challenge is that the, um, you know, sort of the, the whether you use it as fuel or you use it as electricity for uh, other uses, you know, the generation, transmission, distribution cost is the same. Um, so I think Yulia touched on this um, a lot in her presentation, which is, uh, you know, if you can... Uh, structure your rates and structure your um, your interaction with the customer so that they know the most cost effective times to charge their vehicle that uh, that benefit the grid and um, cost the least amount um, for that elect electricity to be generated and transmitted then um, then that's your opportunity to really uh, kind of address that uh, electricity as fuels point. Fantastic. And um, finally, I just want to ask a question about the Biden administration and the focus on growing the grid. Because Tyson, I know you've got, been doing a lot of thinking about this and just how do we get the grid to be resilient enough to handle California's very ambitious and, and national model standards. So how do you see California rolling out the grid resiliency part so that we can match up with the number of chargers and all of the wonderful goals that we're going to try to meet in, in this program and then in our future discussion on CAPDI in a second. Great question. I'm, I don't know if Yulia is still here or then, in, you know, obviously Chair Randolph has a good, I mean, I know enough just to get in trouble and like kind of use the terms of that. Um, you know the planning you have the energy commission doing the integrated energy policy report and that you know helps direct a lot with the investor and utilities or investment investments they're making i mean i think there's there's a whole lot of pressures on investment to you know for grid resiliency with a wildfire resiliency the psps and like um so i think that it's a big you know we're looking at it from a relatively narrow window into a very big system that takes a lot of investments uh to get so I don't want to speak out of turn on that and so but I, I think there's definitely people you know the energy commission and public utilities commission working together to really answer that question and, and then throw on top of that you know getting to 100 percent carbon free by 2045 if not sooner i mean it's it's challenges but it's also real opportunities um so and then of course you know as we start you know certain conversations on offshore wind and they and solar, all these resources where they, you know, getting the stuff where it is being produced to where it's needed. There's just, there's a lot of planning that needs to go into that. But I, I feel like we have a good handle on it as a collective. Yeah. Well, that's the value of this collective. So I'm, I'm so glad we're getting a chance to think about this. And I want to make sure that we get to the rest of our public commenters. But Tyson, thank you for that really thoughtful response. And the, the fact that we're making progress 
And let's get to the public commenters and then I'll call on Chair Randolph and uh, Director Velasquez for some closing remarks and we'll move to uh, our next item. Justin. Thank you, Chair Norton. Up next, we have Bill McGavin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Norton. This is Bill McGavin with the Coalition for Clean Air. And uh, I was really especially pleased to hear so much of an emphasis on transportation equity in your discussion and presentation so far today. We at Coalition for Clean Air, along with our partners in the Charge Ahead California campaign, came together in 2014 to sponsor a bill into law that makes it state policy to electrify the transportation sector in a manner that ensures that all Californians, especially those who are most impacted by vehicular air pollution, can realize the benefits that electric vehicles can provide. And as a result of that legislation, California has a rich portfolio of well-utilized equity-focused programs, some of which you've heard about already this morning, designed to increase access to zero emission vehicles and mobility in disadvantaged and low-income communities. And that includes not only those programs where people end up owning uh, an electric car, but also access to, to car sharing and van pooling so that we're also serving our goal of reducing overall vehicle miles traveled. Um, but to Professor Sperling's point, we do need more funding. Some of these programs are already out of money. And so we are asking the legislature uh, to support the governor's budget proposal and to fund these programs to get them back uh, up and running again as soon as possible. And in addition to light duty, it's vital that we clean up our medium and heavy duty vehicles to displace the toxic diesel emissions that disproportionately impact low income communities of color, often living downwind from freeways, ports, rail yards, warehouses, and other facilities. So when we talk about what the agencies can do, I think really the foundation of California's zero emission vehicle efforts are the regulations that come from the Air Resources Board. And, and the board has upcoming opportunities to add to that through the clean miles standard for the ride hailing fleets, through the next iteration of our clean car standards and the advanced clean fleets rule for trucks requiring uh, truck fleets to buy zero emission vehicles. CTC can help by funding zero emission infrastructure through the trade corridor enhancement program. Last year, uh, you made it clear that such infrastructure is eligible. So now we need to move to the phase where projects are actually getting funded. Uh, and HCD, as we heard earlier this morning, it's so crucial that multifamily dwellings can have access to charging. So we urge you when you uh, look at your building standards to make that as available as possible so that people like Erica, who we saw in the video, can have access to the savings that they get from not having to buy gasoline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Ryan Kenny. Ryan, you're free to unmute yourself and make a comment. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a perspective I want to provide. My name is Ryan Kenny with Clean Energy. Uh, my company is the largest provider of renewable natural gas transportation fuel um, in the country. We have 165 stations alone in California, and we're trying to displace uh, diesel trucks, us and along with the industry. And I want to point out, you know, a lot of the conversation today has been uh, great, and our industry does support uh, the executive order. But I do want to point out that there really isn't a near-term focus on the heavy-duty space. And of course, most of the state's NOx and greenhouse gas emissions come from heavy-duty transportation. But the executive order really uh, doesn't require electrification in the heavy duty space until 2045, and that's where feasible. So we do want to point out that there really isn't um, a viable heavy duty ZEV at this point. The uh, industry is just really getting off the ground. There are a few in production this year, but as far as a one for one um, displacement between heavy duty ZEVs and diesel, they're just, they just aren't there, and they aren't expected to be there for you know the next uh, number of years, um, at least until the uh, omnibus regulation of, of a 0.02 NOx um, standard is required in 2027. So I just want to point out that the industry, um, the renewable fuels industry, along with low NOx industries, 
are ready to help out in the near term, but we just haven't seen any policies that focus on, on the near term for heavy duty transportation. And I just didn't want to get, have that get lost in the discussion today because it's been a great discussion. Both mostly focused on light duty, but heavy duty in the near term is very important as, as well. So I wanted to point that out and uh, would welcome your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tyson, do you want to make any comments about heavy duty trucks right now? I can I can actually make a comment oh, on that. Thank you, Joe Randall. Um, you know, there's absolutely a lot of work uh, on in the near term, both on the regulatory front um, and uh, and we still have incentive programs that are meant to address that sector. So um, there is absolutely a lot of work uh, happening um, in in the short term. We are not waiting until 2045. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that uh, response. And Tyson, did you have anything else you wanted to ask add to Chair Randolph's comment? No, I think that that's right on. So, yeah, thank you. I mean, cool. it, and also thank you to everything Clean Energy's done. I mean, it's it's been it's it's great uh, near term stuff too. Okay, well, we have three more comments left, and we are putting on the three minute clock. Um, I think everybody's generally been at that time, but I want to make sure because we have a very important presentation waiting for us on CAPDI. So, um, next speaker. Next, we have Bill Higgins. Bill, you're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. He did speak already. I, 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 I spoke already. So, um, okay. as much as I think I have something more to say, I'm going to just stay muted. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate okay. that. We appreciate your Thank wise you, first comment, too. Uh, second speaker. Thank you, Chair. We have no other hands raised at this time. We just have one written comment left, which I will uh, I'll read from Eric Barnes. Uh, Eric Barnes, Motorcycle Industry Council. It appears that the direction of charging infrastructure development is towards commuting. Motorcycles are not only used for commuting, but also recreationally along rural routes. Additionally, electric off-highway recreational vehicles need sufficient charging infrastructure at public areas. Are there plans to expand infrastructure development beyond commuting routes to support other use of vehicles? Second question, are there any thoughts or plans in place related to the ending of solar tax incentives and the impact this will have on residential adoption of solar power? Thank you. Chair Randolph, I'll call on you first and then Tyson. Sorry, I had to. Uh, I I had to get off mute. <laughs> uh, I, I I don't I don't have uh, anything to add. It's... Okay, uh, Tyson on motorcycles and uh, access to charging. Well, that's great. Yeah, so it's um, we are working actually with Rivian uh, to start to try to get chargers into the state park system. So that Rivian's being very aggressive and trying to enable that off-road, uh, you know, electric options or at least getting out to those adventure areas and so i imagine a motorcycles could take care of take advantage of the same thing you know just watching the long way up documentary is pretty inspiring just those two coming together so um yeah so there's there's a lot and, and our, we're working with the department of general service with our state parks to figure out which and the uh, cpuc and the ious have gone down that road there was a piece of legislation a couple of years ago that helped direct some of that investment there's there are some challenges getting electrification out to those areas and one final thing is we have a great company that you know just the envision arc solar system that uh, you know that fully integrated just drop it in a parking spot and you know you're good to go so there's options there out in the marketplace that california based fantastic that's great thank you that i believe completes public comment justin are we confirmed yes chair norton that is correct Okay, uh, Chair Randolph, do you have any closing comments? On this I item? do not. I think this was a really great discussion. Um, a lot of good points. Um, really appreciate the work of all of our panelists um, and super excited to have the CAPTI conversation. So uh, I don't have anything to add at this point. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Director Velasquez. Oh, Dito. Thank you. Oh, thank God for a good ditto. Okay, so we are now on agenda item number three, the draft climate action plan for transportation infrastructure or CAPTI. We will hear from Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and Housing Coordination, Darwin Musavi from CalSTA, who will present the draft climate action plan for transportation infrastructure, also known as CAPTI. 
Thank you very much, Darwin, for your patience as we went through the rest of the previous item before lunch. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? We sure can. Great. Well, thank you, Chair Norton, for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Randolph and uh, Director Velasquez for having me here today and uh, uh, commissioners and, and board members. Um, very excited to continue our conversation on the draft climate action plan for transportation infrastructure uh, that we've um, had the opportunity to speak to you all about uh, previously, as well as uh, presented the last CTC meeting uh, back in um, uh, March uh, on this uh, item as well. Um, and I think you know this this conversation will hopefully um, uh, be a, a great kind of complimentary piece to talk about um, in addition to the the Zev conversation we had this morning. Next slide. Uh, one more, please. So this effort to, to put together a climate action plan for transportation infrastructure that is being um, led by by CalSTA um, um, and has been really an interagency effort, including all the, the agencies represented here on, on this joint body uh, here today, was born out of the governor's executive order in 1919 back in, in 2019 where the governor called on uh, our agency to leverage state transportation spending to help, help meet climate change goals. And this executive order, you know, I believe, is, a, is an acknowledgement that um, as important as the zero, zero emission vehicle um, strategies that we heard about today are to meeting our climate um, um, health and equity goals, uh, that they alone are not enough. Um, um, and as we've heard um, um, earlier, um, on the climate side, we, we will continue to have um, vehicles on the road uh, that have combustion engines well beyond our 2035 and, and 2045 targets. From a, um, um, a health perspective, um, we can't continue to, to live um, um, our, our sedentary lifestyles without providing options for more active transportation for folks in addition to the air quality issues that we've talked about amongst um, also thinking about safety um, of of our um, of, of our road users, and then from an equity perspective, you know, ensuring that we have um, access to to options and that folks do not have to depend on one of the most expensive forms of transportation that we have, the car, uh, as their only option to get around is is critical as we think about um, equity moving forward. And so. This this executive order um, tries to tackle um, those different pieces and and lays out um, uh, in different ways our agency can work across the transportation um, funding that um, is available at a statewide level to to help incentivize and prioritize and leverage those dollars in a way that help gets us to um, infrastructure that's that supports these goals. Next slide. And so specifically the executive order calls out over $5 billion of transportation infrastructure funding um, in the form of these programs that you see, um, that you see here. Um, and these programs all have various statutory uh, requirements of their own. The common uh, thread between all these programs is that the state, whether it's through CalSTA, Caltrans, um, or the California Transportation Commission, or a combination of, of those agencies, the state has um, some direct project selection role in these programs, whether it's through uh, uh, grant programs, competitive grant programs where we pick awardees, or through direct uh, funding of these program or these projects. Um, um, we have a role to play in terms of determining uh, which projects get prioritized for funding and, and um, um, influencing the scoping of those projects as well in some cases. Next slide. So given that premise of, of, of wanting to leverage those dollars um, to uh, meet those goals you saw on the first slide of reducing vehicle miles traveled and providing multimodal options for our travelers um, uh, to meet our state goals, we've set out on um, a uh, robust and, and lengthy um, comment, uh, uh, or I should say public process, outreach process, including various opportunities for public input and comment um, we've had um, uh, surveys and workshops, um, uh, uh, many key stakeholder meetings and, and presentations and dialogues with, with key stakeholders, um, and we're continuing to do so 
um, um, moving forward as well, as I'll mention near the end of this, this uh, presentation in terms of future opportunities. Uh, but we've now landed on a public draft that was released in, uh, in early March. Um, next slide. And so this draft, um, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, it is a holistic framework for aligning our state um, infrastructure investments with our climate health and social equity goals um, and is built on the foundation of the fixed and first approach um, established in SB1. So uh, you know, I wanna reiterate that, that this is very much a, a policy framework document. Um, um, uh, much of, as uh, mentioned here, much of the proposed changes that we're talking about are administrative actions that we as agencies can take um, to help implement that policy framework. Um, um, you know, this is not um, a, a, a broader or larger uh, regulatory effort or, or um, and there are very few uh, requests or items related to statutory change uh, in the document. Um, so these are, um, you know, uh, for the, the most part, you know, I would say um, early step actions that we can take uh, within our administrative of authority to help um, implement that vision that, that CAPTA uh, puts out um, that is built on existing uh, framework and, and priorities that SB1 um, has already uh, set forth for us. And finally, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that um, this plan balances um, the fact that we know there's a range of solutions in different contexts needed across the state and that we need to make sure any plan that we put forward um, uh, can be beneficial to all um, areas of the state. So we're, we're simply calling on using our dollars in a way that, that raises up the best um, available um, projects and solutions in every region and every part of the state um, um, uh, within the framework that we've set forward, understanding that that, um, that range and what that looks like and what's available on the ground uh, differs in different contexts. Next slide, please. So the document itself, as I mentioned, um, the framework and the vision that it sets uh, includes 10 guiding principles, which I'll go through here. Um, and then under those, those uh, 10 guiding principles, we've come up with a list of, of seven specific strategies on, on how we can um, um, work towards implementing our guiding principles. Um, and under the seven strategies, we have broken up 30 specific actions um, that uh, the transportation agency uh, can take. And then we're also making recommendations to uh, the California Transportation Commission on, on various actions that that um, uh, we, we recommend they consider as, as well. Um, and I'll go through some of those here today. I, I want to highlight a few um, that I think uh, might be of interest to this group. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the guiding principles that make up the investment framework, there, there are 10 of them. I wanted to start by highlighting these three, which are really about um, some of the key investments that we need to make. Um, as we've talked about today, I won't go into it a whole lot more since we've had a great robust discussion on it. Um, uh, uh, investing in our zero emission vehicle infrastructure is, is key and critical uh, as part of this investment framework. In addition to, to doing so, we need to make sure we're providing um, additional options for, for Californians to get around. Um, um, and so building towards an integrated statewide rail and transit network um, um, is also a key area of investment, as well as investing in networks of safe and accessible bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, uh, we, we heard earlier, I think uh, uh, one of our commenters um, uh, mentioned uh, the need for electric bicycles as well as uh, electric vehicles. And so we need to make sure that we have infrastructure for those types of modes of transportation. Next slide. And as we build um, uh, those infrastructure pieces and focus on, on uh, prioritizing projects that, that get us uh, infrastructure built to support those, those modes, um, we have seven other uh, guiding principles that I, I think of as the, the, the how we do that and how we think about um, making sure we're doing those things in, in a fashion that um, gets us closer to our goals. Um, and and you know I'll, I'll just briefly uh, go through these um, and happy to dive into any of this deeper. But 
um, strengthening our commitment to uh, social and racial equity by reducing public health harms that our projects cause um, while and economic harms and while maximizing the community benefits of those projects to, to um, uh, particularly to communities of color and low-income communities is critical to, to look at within our projects. Um, making safety improvements to reduce fatalities and severe injuries and the focus on um, the, the loss of life and, and uh, injuries when we think about safety improvements on our roadways, I think is, 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 is something we wanna center in the work that we do. Um, as we think about reducing emissions, you know, as you all know, we're already seeing um, uh, the direct impacts of climate change. You know, I know particularly folks in the transportation sector are seeing that on our roadways um, annually. And as we see increased costs of, of, of repairs from um, extreme weather events. So assessing physical climate risk to our infrastructure and incorporating that into our decision-making is absolutely key. Um, and uh, promoting projects um, that do not increase passenger vehicle travel. Now, this one's uh, rather important, I think, as we um, uh, look towards building um, uh, out our transit network um, and a and, uh, bicycle network to provide people options to opt out of congestion and to have alternative modes to get around. We also need to acknowledge that um, the research shows, research on reduced travel shows that particularly in highly congested and urbanized areas that we cannot continue trying to build our way out of congestion and that we're worsening our air quality issues and, and our, our equity issues as well by doing so. Um, um, and that that needs to be a critical part of our decision making. Um, we need to promote uh, compact infill development. Um, as we've discussed today, land use is a is a important part of the solution. The transportation um, strategies we have here and how we spend transportation dollars are just one uh, piece of, of the VMT reduction that we need to see. And, and uh, critically important is, is also ensuring that people have the opportunity to um, live closer to their jobs. And as was mentioned earlier, have jobs closer to their homes as a, as a strategy to uh, reduce their dependence on driving and the amount of driving that they're required to do um, and um, you know the uh, real quick I'll say the flip side of that is is uh, protecting our natural and working lands um, um, in addition to, to um, uh, promoting development in infill areas making sure that the lands that serve other uses aren't converted uh, to development if we're providing enough opportunity for development in the right places and then uh, finally and I think very importantly um, as we think about our zero emission uh, system um, and our zero emission infrastructure, I should say, rolling out, um, uh, particularly, I think, in the transportation infrastructure realm, thinking about the freight system and and I, I emphasize the word system and developing um, um, an actual network and system as part of our planning efforts is really going to be critical to um, uh, continue um, improving our freight mobility moving forward. So with that, uh, next slide, please. And so um, CAPTI puts out seven strategies um, um, on uh, essentially how to uh, uh, bring that uh, set of guiding principles to action and areas that we should focus on. Um, and for the sake of time and for discussion, you know, these actions are just grouping uh, mechanisms for our, or sorry, these strategies are grouping mechanisms for our specific actions that we have laid out. So um, instead of reading through the strategies, I'm gonna just talk about some of the actions that are embedded um, under each of these. And so I've kind of grouped those together on, on the next slide. Um, and I'll share um, two sets of these, but I just wanted to go through um, some here that are under strategy number one and two. Um, and so the, the actions that we've set forward are, are rather specific to the various programs uh, that, that uh, fall under the executive order. But uh, you know, I just wanted to talk about some of the, the, the impact on these, of, of these actions and, and what they could do. Um, specifically, the first two are um, uh, recommendations um, in, in the document to uh, the um, CTC um, on uh, guidelines on the two programs. 
the Solutions for Congested Corridors program, the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. Uh, the first action um, uh, asks to prioritize solutions for uh, uh, congestion in that program that enable travelers to opt out of congestion instead of um, uh, focusing on, on um, increasing throughput uh, for more vehicles, as as we said earlier, particularly in highly congested urbanized areas, research shows that that is a futile effort um, and that we can't relieve congestion that way. So providing those alternatives and focusing our funding on those alternatives um, uh, through the, the funding available there, um, um, I think is, is critical. Um, and the second piece we actually, I think, heard um, echoed earlier in a public comment, um, which is looking at the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program um, and um, uh, providing um, uh, both uh, an opportunity to invest in and also uh, prioritizing investments in zero emission vehicle infrastructure as part of those larger trade corridor uh, um, and, and freight mobility improvement projects that are funded there. I think that's critical. Um, moving on to the, the next strategy items here. Uh, we have a couple items here really aimed at transit recovery as we come out of, of the pandemic. Uh, one is to implement the integrated travel program, uh, which is um, a great program that aims to provide more seamless travel between um, our transit agencies and for transit users, um, which I think is really important in ensuring uh, that transit is, is a competitive mode of travel. Um, uh, ease of access, I think, will be, will be critical, both from a payment standpoint and timing standpoint and, and usability standpoint. Um, and then also supporting transit agencies through our um, uh, Transit Intercity Rail Capital Program in meeting their ZEV targets uh, for their fleet and providing funding through that program to do so um, is what 2.3 is about and that that will be really important. And finally on this slide in terms of our various funding programs is uh, we've heard from a lot of our stakeholders um, that the active transportation program um, which is one of the most oversubscribed programs um, um, or is the most oversubscribed program listed on this executive order um, needs additional funding, particularly long-term um, sustainable committed funding for, for uh, future cycles to come. Um, and so that's something we're committed to exploring within our plan. Next slide, please. All right, and this is my, my last set of actions here I'll go through um, um, with you all. Um, we also have an action uh, around establishing a Transportation Equity and Environmental Justice Advisory Committee amongst um, um, the transportation agencies, CTC, Calista, and Caltrans, and working in conjunction to, to, to do so. Um, um, I think this will be uh, uh, critical to provide um, a space for, for input into our, our programs um, and planning efforts um, um, from representatives, representatives um, um, of those communities. We're also working to develop um, climate risk assessment planning and implementation guidance um, to uh, essentially uh, analyze climate risk on projects as kind of a standard practice is the aim there. Um, we've we've heard a little bit about um, uh, SB 743 and, and, and vehicle miles traveled. Um, uh, metric there. We can, uh, won't get too deep into that right now, but as that gets implemented, we need mechanisms to mitigate um, for VMT and transportation projects. So we're um, interested in exploring that, as well as uh, convening efforts to explore various roadway pricing um, solutions that we could be uh, working to implement with our local and regional partners. Um, and the last two, uh, which are kind of the connection to um, the very important uh, um, land use related and housing work that's happening at the state. Um, we need to make sure that we use our transportation investments and leverage those to incentivize infill housing production, both through um, uh, ensuring that our, our infrastructure is supportive of the right type of, of housing in the right places, um, and, and also um, uh, ensuring that our, our transportation um, partners that are applying to 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 our programs um, um, are where you know uh, they're able to supporting uh, pro infill policies um, and you know this is we, we're looking forward to leveraging the the pro housing policy work that 
a pro housing designation work, I should say, that HCD is working on and partnering with them on implementation in this piece. And uh, the last item here, which I'm very excited about, um, and this is something that um, is also um, reflected in the new uh, American Jobs uh, Plan that the Biden administration has released, um, is uh, we'd like to explore creating a highways to boulevards conversion program, pilot program, which really looks at um, particularly um, low income and disadvantaged communities, communities of color, um, where um, uh, underutilized highways have played a key role in dividing those communities, um, and not only looking at, at repairing those those divides, but also using the opportunity um, to um, uh, rebuild in a way that that uh, brings more housing, particularly affordable housing, to those communities as those conversion of those projects happen. Um, you know, this is something that I think. Um, the federal government's really interested in exploring, so we want to make sure we position California um, in a competitive manner for, for those dollars by um, uh, finding opportunities to fund the planning on that work. So um, I just wanted to share that smattering of, I know that's a lot of different strat uh, actions and that's only a few of what's in the plan, uh, but to give you all a sense of the, the various different um, uh, types of things we're, we're looking to tackle, um, um, with this with this plan, uh, we hope to um, kind of continue having a regular evaluation of this effort once it's complete in July, and to come back to you all and, and present um, on annual progress reports at future joint meetings if you all are are, are willing to have us. Um, and uh, you know, with that, I'd like to uh, go to the next slide and talk about. Um, some future opportunities for engagement for folks who are, who are tuned in here today. Um, and then um, we can open it up for discussion. But um, I had to turn these slides in um, uh, over a week ago, so I don't have the uh, most updated information here, but we do have additional workshop opportunities coming up. Um, the CTC will be um, um, hosting uh, uh, two workshops in partnership with CalSTA and, and Caltrans um, coming up on, um, April 20th and 23rd, uh, the Public Health Work Group um, as part of the Climate Action Team, which is, I believe, co-sponsored by CARB and, and CDPH on April 22nd, will we'll also be hosting an opportunity to discuss uh, CAPTI. Um, and then we will also be extending the, the public feedback uh, deadline um, I believe our, our target date for that is is um, the third week of May, and we'll be getting um, a um, a uh, updated kind of date as well as all those workshop um, dates out to our stakeholders on our stakeholder list as well as our website. Hopefully by the end of this week. Um, so with all of that, um, would love to, to uh, turn it back over to you, Chair Norton, and, and open it up for discussion. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Darwin, for making such a um, thorough presentation. I see I have two commissioners of mine, um, Vice Chair Alvarado and Chairwoman Inman, and now Chairwoman Eager. Um, I also see uh, CARB Board Member Dan Sperling and more are jumping on so let me let you get to questions and then um we will move on to um future of uh, public comment because i know public commenters are starting to um raise their hands as well so vice chair alvarado we'll start with you thank you madam chair uh baron s24 you're going to increase the funding um is it still is that new funding new monies that are coming in or is it still relying on taking monies from existing programs great question commissioner so um uh, 2.4 talks about increasing the active transportation program uh what we've uh, said in the draft that's out publicly now is that we're looking for stakeholders to recommend um uh, pathways forward to that and that we're kind of you know open to to um, um uh, various options what we have also stated in that in the document is that our number one priority would be new funding. And we're particularly interested in looking at federal funding that, that may be coming uh, our way in the future as, as a prioritization uh, for, for where to um, um, 
find that um, kind of a permanent source of, of, of uh, money for that program that very much needs it. Um, but we're open to, to hearing from others to see if there, you know, if there are other opportunities, including existing programs that, that we could explore if um, um, you know, new funding were not to be available. So, so the, the plan on rating the other programs is still in play? The, the uh, document um, uh, asks stakeholders for options so and that list to, of the existing programs so as potential options um, that we're willing to explore, yes. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Alvarado? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Inman? You're muted. Commissioner Inman? Sorry, can, guys. Sorry. There you go. I was anxious to get going here. Anyway, Darwin, <laughs> I hope you were able to join us this morning. Uh, we had a very rich uh, morning. And if you weren't, um, I'm sure it's recorded. But a, a lot of things, and I think Taria really, um, was meaningful and insightful for all of us. And, and I'm thinking about as we do this CAPTI, um, she encouraged us in terms of our equity to be culturally sensitive. And I, I think we also need to be operationally sensitive. So thinking of the culture of our businesses and those operations, and also uh, thinking about um, the language we speak and you know all of us that for whatever perch we sit on we, we speak a funny language so to speak whether it's the acronym soup of transportation uh, or energy you name it so I think for all of us we need to um, really listen and think about the lesson she was sharing with us and how, how the work we all do so I would encourage you uh, if you weren't able to join us. Um, and I know there's going to be some follow-up work that we're all going to be doing together. So I think that would really um, be meaningful. And, you know, we heard today from Commissioner Liu that Mitch, our executive director, Mitch Weiss, is going to solve all the congestion at the ports. Um, but I think seriously, when you talk about uh, the goods movement sector, remember that we have a system of systems. So we have such codependency. And I think the group that's here together is representing, representative of the codependency that we all feel between the nexus between emissions, air quality, housing, economics, uh, and mobility. So I think for all of us, uh, we just really have to think about that. And, you know, Gustavo was war reminding us this morning that we have some unintended consequences. And as we desperately saw, seek to solve the housing crisis in our state, some of the things we do just drive that a little more out of reach, a little more out of reach. So I think we all have to work really smart and efficiently to make sure that every dollar collectively moves, rises the whole tide, I, I think for everyone. So one question in all of this that I have um, is really about our RTP planning. And Bill Higgins was just here reminding us about uh, to pay attention to our journey away from gas and the gas tax, therefore. So we really do have to work together to figure out what our funding source is going to be. But between the RTP and the sustainable community strategies that each of our communities, how did all of that roll into the work that you all did? That's a great, great question, uh, Commissioner Inman. Um, you know, in terms of the the interplay between this document and the, the work happening at the regions, obviously many of the projects we're talking about um, here are are identified and funded through, um, or I should say identified um, and um, uh, partially funded through the RTP um, um, lists of projects. Um, and, you know, the, the vision for uh, how all of this plays out um, in each region is, is very much embedded in those regional plans. 
Um, I think what we're talking about here in the aspect of that the statewide climate action plan is bringing is how do we how do we essentially align um, our um, state goals and, and and I should say state programs and planning efforts um, to to also work towards those goals that our regional governments are working towards, uh, and then prioritize the limited state funding that we have um, uh, to um, uh, essentially fund the, the high impact um, uh, projects in, uh, in terms of uh, climate health and equity um, that are found in those various regional plans that you're talking about. Um, so, you know, this is very much oriented around, um, uh, you know, what the state can bring to the table as, as the regions uh, work on those efforts. <laughs> So was, are, are you describing then a process where the, the locals have done their work and then you would seek the alignment of where you could embellish that? Or is it, I, I just worry about taking the Matterhorn out of Disneyland, so to speak, if you forgive the uh, triteness of my roots, my hospitality roots, but you know, we were always warned that you have this critical mass. And, and so I, I, I'm a little confused with that in terms of how how is the synergy of the alignment there? And probably maybe it's too soon to know. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, as, as you know, even, even um, uh, now, as we um, fund various projects that uh, are are brought forward through the competitive programs, um, you know we're we're having to pick and choose amongst various projects that are in RTPs across across the state. So I think this plan doesn't change that dynamic. Um, we're just talking about um, um, uh, providing some guiding principles on on how uh, the state should maybe prioritize. Um, um, amongst the competition um, uh, of those projects uh, a little bit differently, um, understanding that, that the projects are still being identified through and, and, and uh, are part of you know, the regional solutions in, in, in each of those regions and, and we have limited funding um, and uh, with that have to make uh, decisions on, on uh, where we put um, our piece um, uh, amongst what the regions are trying to do, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, does that finish your comments? Okay, I'll move to uh, Commissioner Inger. Yes, uh, thank you. And I, I wanted to add on to and thank uh, Mr. Edmund on her uh, views on inclusion. Um, I think sometimes we forget there's all kinds of parts of California, but also um, a lot of different voices. And and I'm afraid sometimes we hear the same voices over and over again from our stakeholders. Um, and so um, as we go forward and we do our workshops um, to include uh, different industries, different uh, business community groups so that we can hear those voices is very important. And I know we're doing that um, at the CTC. We, I know I've sent in about a list of 30 or 40 different entities that we'd, we'd like to hear from, but I would encourage everyone uh, to reach out to uh, those voices that we haven't heard from before, because I know they also believe that this is really important. And I think as, as Commissioner Inman said, um, we also have to put it in a way that they understand and not use uh, those acronyms that they say, why did I get this? I don't even know what this means, right? Um, because we do care what they think, and we do want to make sure that they're included in this process. Thank you. Yeah. Darwin, did you want to say a little bit about, you know, the one size not fitting all and, and regional um, exploration? Because I think Captive mentioned something about that, but how are you handling some of the areas of the state that may not be in the same place that some areas are? Certainly, um, you know, I think it's a it's a obviously a critical point and it's a challenge that we all have with any sort of um, um, statewide policy work that we do, um, um, given the diversity of the state. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the, the guiding principles that we've put forward, um, you know, they are, are rather high level. Um, um, and that's because the specific solutions will look very different. You know, we, we think. Um, for example, um, 
the concept of, of active transportation projects um, and active transportation as a mode is, is um, uh, universally important in, in communities around the state, but um, uh, why they're important, how they're important, what that looks like in different places is very different. In some places, you know, it could be um, uh, about uh, connecting, um, you know, community members uh, to their school in a disadvantaged community where there isn't even a sidewalk or a bike lane. In other places, it could be about, um, you know, a, a, a big protected bike boulevard or a bikeway in an urban uh, environment. So, um, you know, the we've we've um, uh, tried to put forward um, a framework that um, we think can apply. Um, 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 everywhere, and then what the specific solutions look like, um, obviously, will will uh, vary greatly. And we have also, I should say, we have some specific actions around um, working with um, um, uh, stakeholders across the state, where we think there's um, room for the state to be more supportive of different types of solutions. For example, we've called out the need to have uh, discussions with our rural transit agencies on how the, bait, uh, the state can better fund and support uh, rural transportation solutions. We tend to, uh, at least at a statewide level, um, you know, given how the, the funding programs are set out, um, and this is, I think, the case amongst all of our programs, you know, bigger projects sometimes tend to compete well. We've seen it in the active transportation program as well, and that's, that's just the nature of, you know, competing at a statewide level. So how do we make sure that, that we're not leaving behind um, 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 you know, in, in that case, in that example, smaller um, um, and, and uh, often disadvantaged communities that, that could benefit from those state dollars. Great. Thank you very much, Darwin. Um, our next speaker is uh, CARB board member Dan Sperling. Thank, thank you very much. Um, again, we're having a very useful, fruitful discussion here. Um, I want to say that um, this folk, one of the areas that really underlying a lot of what uh, CAPTI is about is this idea of reducing VMT. And I understand that's e even a naive uh, professor knows that that's a politically challenging goal to have. But it's hugely, hugely important because, for one thing, it's really an indicator, it's a, a, a strategy for improving health. It's a strategy for reducing cost, both to the state, for infrastructure, to users. It's a way of improving community, a more efficient use of land. And so uh, just a little bit of context on this is that we've, in California, we've created a car-centric transportation system. And what I mean by that is, Almost everyone relies on light duty vehicles for mobility. Mass transit serves less than 2%, 2% of our passenger miles in California. Okay, so transit's important for some, for many people in many communities, but if we look at it in terms of how many people it actually serves, if we think about it in terms of how many people uh, can't afford a car, people that are physically disadvantaged, that can't drive a car, um, we are doing a very poor job in California of serving our population. In fact, one could even say it's certainly irresponsible, even verging on criminal, on what a large percentage of our population we are marginalizing. That is the equity question here, problem here, uh, certainly in a transportation sense. And so when we think about, and you know, it's like we talk about it, lots of people have cars, even relatively low income people, but the reality is that many of those cars are unreliable. There's multiple people depending on it. And so there's a large percentage of our population that has poor access to jobs, to health services, uh, to all of the activities of our society. And so if we say, many people say then, well, reducing VMT is the wrong strategy, but that's incorrect. What our goal should be is reducing VMT, but increasing accessibility, 
uh, for many of the segments of our population. And we can do this. We can increase accessibility by re and reduce VMT. These are not incompatible. In fact, they're very consistent and they together lead to huge benefits to our state and to people. And the reason that's true is because we at our, are at a really important point in history. We, in transportation, we've had many decades arguably all the way back to, to the advent of freeways or even the, back to the Model T, where we've had very little innovation in transportation, in systems innovation. I mean, our transportation system functionally hasn't changed in decade after decade after decade. But now we have the innovations. We have the opportunity to do it much better. We have you know, what we call micro-mobility. So, you know, the, the uh, um, dockless bikes, dockless scooters. We have micro-transit uh, where we can use a lot of the demand-responsive technologies pioneered by Uber and Lyft to apply it to transit, to use small vehicles, companies like Via, for instance. Um, we can integrate all this together, we can make sure that transit is better partnered with some of these other services. We have many innovations, many opportunities to improve our transportation system. And the, the thrust of what Darwin's talking about with CAPTI is exactly that. And I want to give it the strongest endorsement possible because you know, we can argue about some of the details, but CARB, CTC, housing, we should be embracing these goals and figuring out the details of how to do it, how to do it right. This, this is the right side of history. We are in a, you know, a crossroads of history right now. And to, and we should be focusing on how do we provide a transportation system that's less expensive. You know, we have created the most resource intensive, expensive transportation system imaginable. Um, you know, the cost of owning a car, if you get a new car, it's costing about $9,000 per year to own and operate it. Even if you have a used car, if you operate it 15,000 miles, kind of the average, it comes, you know, it's up in the five or $6,000 a year range. I mean, that is, that is, you know, bad. <laughs> it's undesirable, you know, from an equity perspective, from an environmental perspective, and from an economic perspective. So I just want to say that this present, this CAPTI uh, program, in, in terms of this overall thrust, is is exactly what we need to be embracing and working on. It's really hard. It's really complicated because there's. It's not just us three agencies. It's a lot of it's local governments that are dealing with it. It's, it's land use issues. It's really hard, but you know the benefit of a meeting like this is to, for all of us to agree, eventually, hopefully, you know that this is the basic thrust going forward. So um, thank you and and thank you Darwin. Thank you, Calsta, for leadership on this. So board member Sperling, there was no question. Just just an endorsement. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Grisby. Uh, thank you, Chair Norton. And uh, thank you, Darren, for a great presentation. I uh, wanted to actually associate myself with Commissioner Sperling's comments about CapTi. Uh, and also wanted to pose a question to Darwin. Um, I know a lot has been said about, about the unaffordability of our urban centers. Uh, on page 16 of the public draft, for CAPTI, I think there are some great uh, interventions that have been listed there that could actually address some of the out-of-pocket costs associated with housing and transportation in the state. Uh, could you elaborate on some of those? Thank you. Sure, happy happy to do so. Um, um, apologies, I don't have the document right in front of me to, to, to note what's specifically referenced on page 16, but um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about how the the document um, 
addresses uh, addresses those uh, those costs in particular. You know, I think um, you know one one mechanism that that we um, often think about as as you know, and I think has been has been thought about as as um, you know just an additional uh, cost on travel, but can be very beneficial if if used um, appropriately. Um, to reduce that cost burden um, is actually, you know, roadway pricing, and the document does discuss roadway pricing, and and um, you know we think that the um, roadway pricing, if used appropriately, um, can actually help um, shift um, the burden of cost of travel, um, um, uh, particularly um, on on low income um, uh, populations and and communities of color. Um, uh, in a way that essentially um, helps us move towards a more more equitable um, uh, cost burden of transportation. You know, there's there's a lot you can do with dynamic pricing, both in terms of transit priority and prioritization, to allow for more reliable um, 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 and and um, better transit service that is uh, both cost and time competitive. Um, you can also um, price uh, users users of the road. Uh, um, differently, um, um, based on income, if you chose to do so, there's you know various dynamic levers on, on how uh, that can be utilized. But you know, I think uh, 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 pricing is a key VMT reduction strategy that that can um, um, uh, also uh, be a key equity strategy if, if utilized correctly. You know, I think the the documents. Um, uh actions around as i mentioned earlier some of the uh, supporting um uh, housing strategies is also really important in terms of that that cost burden um I, I think you know we need to start thinking about our transportation projects at less as just standalone transportation projects um but um as as projects that are really trying to connect people to their destinations as we talked about um, um, earlier, you know, whether that's thinking about um, what type of development uh, we're, we're um, uh, essentially setting up for by the transportation project that we put in is, is really important. Um, we've already, for example, through the um, Transit Inner City Rail Capital Program through efforts um, that uh, happened last year in coordination with HCD made some updates uh, to have that program really incentivize transit projects that are thinking about uh, what levels of density they would be able to support with the land uses around them. Um, you know, those types of, of kind of more cross-cutting um, strategies when we think about designing transportation projects, um, I think are critical and things that we try to incentivize in the plan. But uh, Commissioner Grisby, if there are specific things that you were thinking of that I did not comment on, happy to um, elaborate. Sorry, I don't have page 16 in front of me. Thanks a lot, Darwin. Um Director Velasquez has to leave soon, and so I wanted to jump the order just to give him an opportunity to um, say a few words before he has to go. Director Velasquez. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to just echo our support here at HCD for um, continue to work with Darwin and everyone that is working on this, has been working on this plan, will continue to work on this plan to really make CAPTAI a success. Uh, I have to um, say, I don't know if you've noticed in the president's infrastructure plan, you know, again, making the case of uh, housing as infrastructure, there are there are some references what, that are really exciting to me around zoning as a, as a way kind of easing zoning and land use at the local level as a way to reactivate the economy through housing production and how the federal government can support uh, that process. I um, It's very exciting uh, to see that uh, California can actually be a model that can be replicated. Uh, uh, if you all remember last uh, the last joint meeting in November, uh, we provided an update on the development of our pro-housing designation program. I mean, it, it really comes down to um, in order to, I think, activate a lot of the things that CAPTI calls for, the idea of looking at our local land use and zoning is so critical. Uh, 
we are in the final stages of adopting that set of regulations that will be used to evaluate and incentivize local land use policies. Uh, pro housing program will challenge local governments to step up, continue to step up, even going beyond the new requirements for housing elements to promote location efficient housing production. The, the idea here is to use that as a way to uh, integrate our transportation and climate goals very much in line with what we're asking local governments to do around zoning. And uh, as we look forward to working with CalSTAS, CTC, CARB, and other agencies to making pro housing and housing element compliance a central part of implementing CAPTI, I think this is a, this is a, a part of our involvement in CAPTI that is uh, exciting and look forward to continue, um, uh, HCD to continue to work on this. So, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Director Velasquez, for your participation in today's joint meeting. We truly appreciate your partnership. And uh, next, I wanted to um, call on Director Gardino, as I had promised him I would, even though he's not on screen right now. I, I believe I am. You are now. Great. Thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, and Darwin, I want to thank you again for months and months of thoughtful work on this to bring people together and come together with a credible plan to, to move us forward. I want to go back to a comment uh, earlier made by Commissioner Bob Alvarado, uh, which I agree with and want to build on. And that's about our mutual desire to grow the amount of funds for active transportation programs. So it's not just a personal passion of a bike commuter who is looking forward to the day when he can commute by bike again, rather than just being in my house 24-7, uh, but also from the perspective of all the goals we're trying to achieve from traffic to relief to air quality improvement to healthier lifestyles, all those goals are key to growing the funds for active transportation. Uh, but what I wanted to build on was uh, uh, Commissioner Alvarado's comment about the funding source. And uh, I, I want to um, stress that I will work incredibly hard with you to grow the pie rather than to fight over the crumbs. I think is incredibly difficult if we're talking about shifting funds. One, because every pool of funds has an importance to our communities and to our state. Uh, two, if we're talking about shifting funds from how they were allocated in Senate Bill 1 and how hard that was to pass and get signed for those of us like myself and Commissioner Alvarado and others to work on, but then what we had to do to fight back Proposition 6 in November of 2018 where voters stressed again their trust that the funds would be used as specified in SB1 and none of us wanting to violate that trust. Uh, so again, if we're emphasizing more funds, you absolutely have my full support to lean in and work on that. Uh, but if we're talking about trying to fight over the crumbs, rather than to grow the pie and grow the funds, uh, that would be more challenging. Thank you. Darwin, do you want to say a few words on that or um, about growing the pie versus working within? Yeah. Sure, yeah, and I appreciate those comments and that is you know, certainly um, Cal's position as well in terms of our, our um, um, order of, of priority and, and 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 preference, you know, I think part of why the document acknowledges that we need to really look at this seriously and and um, um, it goes beyond just saying the words new funding is that you know we do think it's 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 critical to highlight um, um, and um, how serious we are about the commitment to making sure the vector transportation projects that are backlogged are are. Are funded, um, 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 and that you know we, we can't simply say uh, um, you know we're just going to sit here and, and wait for funding. So I, I do think that that our goal is um, is um, uh, very much so to to focus on 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 new funding, um, um, and you know I don't anticipate or you know and I hope that uh, there's no need to think about 
you know, how else we we um, um, uh, we pursue funding funding ATP. Um, but you know, I, I think um, just the seriousness of the matter required us to to, to emphasize that um, ATP um, um, increase needs to be looked at looked at seriously, and all options should be explored. Um, but I certainly agree that the ideal ideal solution is is um, um, you know new funding, and and I'm hoping um, as as we look forward um, over the coming coming months here that there'll be um, opportunities. Um, uh, particularly in partnership with the federal government to, to, to make that a reality. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Darwin. Um, Director, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> Chair Randolph, I was wondering if you had a couple of words and then I'd like to call on your board members, uh, Pacheco Werner, uh, Davina Hurt, Nathan Fletcher, and Hector De La Torre in the order that they came up on my screen. Thank you, Chair Norton. Um, Actually, that, that discussion uh, and the question Darwin just responded to um, kind of hit a key point. So he, he answered a, a, a question that I was going to ask. But um, I guess just by way of um, uh, sharing some support for this process, uh, I just wanted to note uh, to Darwin's point that it seems like the timing on this is perfect because we really are laying out kind of key principles, key strategies, key goals um, that are, are here and ready um, to take advantage of, of Build Back Better. Um, and hopefully that will, will yield some results. Um, and we will have, have an opportunity to put these principles into action. Um, and so I, uh, I appreciated the, the calendar you've laid out in terms of, of a, a plan for final adoption. And I really hope we can, we can stick to that plan as we you know, continue to, to workshop these issues and gain feedback. Um, but uh, I, I think getting this done by the middle of this year could really uh, reap a, a huge amount of benefit for the state uh, and for our, our shared goals. So I think that's really important. And I will uh, yield the floor to my colleagues because I know um, folks will probably have a lot to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Randolph. And now um, board member Pacheco Werner. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to, I really appreciate the the special focus on rural areas too, um, because I think it's important when thinking about these projects as they're integrating with rural transportation, um, that they have a unique focus on the people that already live there. Um, and, um, and, and so thinking about infill as rural infill too, rather than expansion, um, when I look at my region in the Central Valley, and particularly Fresno County, I don't I don't see just one housing problem. I see an affordable housing problem, and I see suburban sprawl in many new housing units that are only serving the very top of our um, income tiered housing market. And so I think it's important to 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 think about that within those nuances. And I would also say that. Um, in thinking about um, the um, BIPOC communities and historically disadvantaged, there's an important fine balance between the policies that, that are supporting or promoting projects that do not significantly increase passenger vehicle travel and promoting compact infill development um, while protecting residents and businesses from displacement. And the reason I say that, it, the fine balance, is because these communities are often already fighting heavy pollution from large polluting industries in their neighborhoods and aren't really benefiting from those jobs nearby because they go to people that live outside of their own neighborhoods. And, and so um, in, that, in that balance between promoting not traveling for, for work and infill, there's also having to live with the historical environmental racism that exists in many communities. So I'm just, I, I was just wondering, you know, what, what do you see as, as being done about navigating this fine balance in addition to some of what Director Velasquez spoke about just earlier? Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, board member. That's a great uh, question, um, and you know, uh, I appreciate your your thoughtful comments on it. We've we've been grappling with and thinking about this issue um, 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 a lot. You know, I think one thing I'll I'll say in terms of 
uh, projects that that um, can increase passenger vehicle travel. You know, I think what's in, important to to think about and note there is that you know we know that the uh, commute times and their representation and and link to to commute costs are a huge burden, particularly on BIPOC communities. Um, you know, as you mentioned, um, 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 uh, particularly in areas where folks do have to drive long distances to get to um, um, get to their jobs, which is why those those um, housing uh, strategies that we talked about are incredibly critical. But in terms of of projects um, that uh, increase passenger vehicle travel, we also know that the research shows that. Um, uh, addressing uh, driving or encouraging um, additional driving doesn't even necessarily end up um, benefiting those travelers through um, um, a direct reduction in uh, 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 travel time, particularly in some of the most congested routes that we have in the state uh, due to the, the concept of, of, of induced travel. Um, and so, you know, I think that's really what we're, we're getting at with that point is, is not to say that uh, people who rely on it um, um, and and who will continue to need so and who have no other choice, you know, we're not trying to discourage those folks from driving. We're trying to provide other folks who have the ability to and want um, uh, more affordable um, uh, alternatives for transportation and to not sit in that traffic and do so to to provide um, um, uh, smoother um, uh, traffic and travel opportunities for our drivers. Um, and so that's really what that, that piece is about, and I appreciate you giving me the chance to explain that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, board member Hurt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to center my thoughts on a couple of quick points, and I definitely want to align my comments to Director Sparing and uh, also Dr. Pacheco Werner um, with regards to the equity and kind of the necessary cultural behavioral change I think we need to endeavor upon. I mean, the car is flexible, it's comfortable, and it's fast. And like myself, I have a family, I have children, it's really necessary in order to get around to all the different places um, that we need to, um, to get to, whether it be shopping or dropping kids off. Things are a little bit different post-COVID, but we will get back to that space again. And so there's a real tension between the reduction of VMT and using public transit and also expediency. And so how do we create regulation and also message on this transition, I think should be first and foremost in our thoughts, as well as thinking outside the box. You know, some countries are creating super cycle highways. Is that something that we can do um, to get more people using alternative methods of transportation, but then again, remembering that there are many of us that still need to use the car. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the equity piece, um, and I have a question as well, but I think we should reflect more on um, how inequity is in these communities already and how some of these major highways slash right through the communities, and so, how do we truly become equitable without widening the gap and focusing on solutions that really help them and not harm folks in these spaces? And I think part of that is being honest about if we're gonna um, support different projects, are we supporting projects that are then supporting those major highways through these roads? Like, I think we need a wholesale thinking in some of these communities so that they really have a chance. Um, to thrive and not be left behind. Um, and my question that I'd love to um, get an answer to is, in the summary, it indicates that Caltrans will be developing an equity index to guide review of transportation uh, funding decisions by state agencies. And I'm wondering how will the new index support, duplicate, or interact with other indices on equity, such as HPI or Cal Enviro screen. You could talk a little bit about that. I think it's important that we don't create another equity index um, so that local agencies and, and others can really um, make a difference and follow what needs to be done. Those are my comments, thanks. Thank you, um, uh, board member, for those, that uh, particular question and an opportunity to talk about the, the, the equity index. 
um, which we're uh, really excited about. Um, you know, I think uh, first of all, I'll, I'll say that um, uh, that um, item um, has not yet launched and is, you know, in, in its infancy in terms of a conceptual phase. Um, the hope is to have a, a kind of a robust public process around its development when we get there, you know, after this plan is finalized and we, we embark on that action. Um, uh, so there'll be uh, plenty of opportunity for specific input and shaping what that idea could could be, what it could turn into. What I'll say in terms of of what it is now, and at a, at a very high conceptual level that, that we've thought um, thought about it, um, is to build off of um, the the Healthy Places Index and Cal Envirus Screen existing tools and data sets that are out out there, and to think about specifically when we talk about um, um, uh, access. Um, and and improving um, accessibility to, to destinations and people's transportation access and the role that equity plays and their lack of access to where they need to go. Um, which of those factors should we be looking at when we look at our own projects? Um, and so, you know, I don't think we're necessarily aiming to to at this point um, have um, you know uh, some sort of of of, of tool that that um, would be required amongst all of, across all of our programs, um, um, like a Cal Envirus screen. And, you know, I think we're just talking about at this point um, uh, coming up with and having the right data sets and data pieces that exist in those existing equity tools uh, to to reflect on um um when you know caltrans in particular makes project decisions you know for example you know data points like like existing car ownership um um and and um uh, maybe a a a screen of of um uh, income and other socioeconomic data points layered on top of each other um as well as in the current modal split on a specific route paint a big picture as to what's going on um, um, from a, a social and racial equity perspective in a, in a particular community and transportation standpoint. And you know, those, to be frank, a lot of those data sets and, and those data points are not currently being used in, in project development or planning in the transportation space. So we're just looking to bring those pieces in into that conversation um, and not um, uh, you know, necessarily create a um, uh, a competing tool for for um, um, uh, kind of uh, use across all the programs, if that makes sense. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, I, I'd like to call on Board Member Fletcher next. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Norton, and uh, it's good to, uh, to to join you all today. Um, I, you know, I wanted to, to echo um, some of the comments we've heard from Dr. Sperling and others around that. The, what I see is the, the crucial importance of the CAPTI process and and why it is it is so desperately needed. This notion of actually embracing the belief that we're going to fund things that reduce VMT. Um, and and I just want to share my perspective. I sit in a in a unique um, situation right now, not only as a member of the Air Resources Board, uh, as chair of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, where we have land use. Uh, decision making that we do as a component of that and simultaneously as chair of Metropolitan Transit System, our transit agency uh, here in, in San Diego. And, and we have this tremendous conflict between the housing obligation that we have, and I believe we must build more housing. I absolutely believe we must build more housing uh, in, in, in more affordable ways. And the very real challenge we have uh, both uh, from an environmental standpoint around reducing BMTs. And the two, it's not impossible to do the two. You can build more housing and you can lower VMTs, but it is so freaking hard when you're trying to do something different to get a different outcome when you have legacy mindset and legacy systems that, that created the inverse. And, and so every day we're trying to achieve this aim of, we need to build more housing and we need to lower VMTs in a system that is designed to do the exact opposite. And, and so I think that forces us to really think deeply about how we challenge a lot of those legacy mindsets and, and legacy systems because they have to fundamentally change. And, and I get change is hard. I mean, everything was put in place and at the time it was put in place, it probably made sense and you build up institutions around it and you build up ways of thinking around it and, and it makes it so difficult. But to just give you a case study, into the reality of how difficult this becomes on the ground. 
So the unincorporated area of San Diego County where we have land use authority um, is, it, it's not the appropriate place for massive quantities of housing. Uh, it's in high fire prone areas. Uh, we have significant water challenges and it is not connected in substantive ways at all uh, to transit systems. And so we went and in our arena process, we, we had great success in lowering significantly by about 70% uh, our obligation in the unincorporated and under arena. Now we have additional challenges is in that I'm building considerable volumes of affordable housing, dense housing on county owned land that happens to be in the appropriate place, but the appropriate place is not in my land use authority, it's county owned land in other jurisdictions. Now, when I take that land and I take my money and I build that, I get zero arena credit for that, but we do it because it's the right thing to do for where it should go. But we reduce our arena number by 70%. Now, let's come into, now we have to fill out our report to submit for where we're gonna place that. Now, if I were to take all of our VMT efficient areas, right, our 743 VMT efficient areas, it is impossible for me to meet my RENA goal in VMT efficient areas without running up against AB 686 problems. It, it just, it does not work. You can't physically do it. And so how do you overcome that challenge? Well, we don't wanna build outside of VMT efficient areas, so how would we do that? Well, we would need to create more VMT efficient areas, right? It's the only way we could do it. But the challenge that you run into there, and this is a challenge that we have to find, is how do we make it easier to fund transit? Because as chair of my transit agency right now, I have two choices. I can go to the voters and pre-COVID, we were gonna roll the dice and try this, but that means I've gotta get a two thirds vote of the public to fund something that presently only 2% as Dan Sperling point out use. And that is incredibly challenging. And, and people say, why would we fund something that only 2% of people use? I'm like, so maybe more than 2% of the people would use it. But again, that, that's a challenge because our legacy system says to increase funding for transit, it, via the mechanism at our disposal requires a two-thirds vote of the public. Now, the second thing is I could try and build a transit system, a expanded transit system on the backs of Fairbox, but we know that puts you in a death spiral. I mean, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. And so we've got to figure out how we can fund uh, these systems in a better way. And transit agents, we're doing everything we can. We're looking at counterflow traffic on freeways that are empty, you know, directionally at different times. We're taking shoulders and making bus only lanes. I mean, we're doing everything we can possibly do, but ultimately uh, it does come down to, to that notion and, and reframing this debate around, and, and somebody had, had spoken to this too, but the, the massive funding, the massive volume, if, if we look at the totality of funding that goes into supporting the car culture and the car ecosystem, I mean, just look at parking, look, look at the, the, the public costs associated with, with just parking to fund that and then contrast that with, with what we invest in transit and, and how we do it. And so, you know, these are a, a, a few of like, these are the things that, that we have to do, which is why I think programs like this, that if we can, if we can start driving this transportation funding in a way that, that really enhances VMT reduction, uh, it not only enhances VMT reduction, but as we start funding that, it makes it easier to construct the housing uh, in the most appropriate place. Uh, another challenge, I think, it's, it's, you know, it's just hard is a generational challenge, right? We have folks in decision-making positions, and, not, and, and we're all a part of this, right? But who, who came up in a, in a different era? You know, when, when, you know, my students at UC San Diego are like, I don't want a car. What are you talking about? Like, you got to park it somewhere. You got to put gas in it. Like, I, you got to get insurance. Like, oh my God, that's terrible. But yet we still can't, we're, we're having a hard time making that bridge, right? I mean, my kids call me a boomer and I'm like, sometimes in some of these conversations, I'm like, we've got to make this generational shift uh, in, in order to, uh, to, to achieve the aims. And I think a part of this, and this is heresy uh, for local government officials, but look, I think we've got to look at the land use decision-making authority process. Because if we're going to live in a world where the notion of a single duplex is such a scary concept for a city council or a board of supervisors to oppose, then perhaps they shouldn't have that be making the ones making that decision. Um, because the, you know, the challenge is then when we do find those projects in the right places, you can't overcome you know, the 17 folks that, that it's, it's going to destroy the world as they know it, particularly when it's affordable. And so I think, I think what you're doing here and what you're trying to put in place, if done right, if done right, uh, can can be can be very very helpful. If not done right, then it's just going to perpetuate the same frustration that, that we all face here. And so I guess my question is, 
how do you envision the quantification of like how how do you do this? And I and I and I know you won't have a definitive answer today. And I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not supposing that. I know that you're working through this. But you know how how does this actually manifest itself in 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 a funding mechanism to prioritize those projects that are going to help us achieve the aims that, that that we're trying to achieve at a local level? Well, thank thank you. Uh... Uh, board member Fletcher for those those comments and I really appreciate the, the on the ground examples of, of the challenges of this work and I think it uh, um, I appreciate you uh, telling that story before asking me that question because it gives me a bit of a free pass because you acknowledge yourself how difficult this question is <laughs> but uh, but that's not to say that that um, um, you know uh, we're we're thinking through uh, these exact same challenges and like you're right you know this is um, this this plan and 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 this process has had you know um, uh, opinions kind of across the board um, in terms of, of of what this could do for for uh, California a lot of excitement um, and, um, as well as a lot of uncertainty um, and and questions uh, because uh, this is you know we're talking about a, a, a at a high level and this is again just a policy framework document. Um, setting a policy framework that is a shift in terms of how we think about uh, those those priorities. But uh, to to your point about um, uh, doing it right, you know, I think the uh, the implementation and and you know uh, what we can then do with this policy uh, framework uh, will will ultimately determine um, its success. Even though it's valuable to have that framework out there. Um, I think that in, a, in and of itself is a is a is kind of a huge uh, change and and can be really um, helpful. You know, so we in terms of the actions that we have, um, I think uh, uh, we've specifically, you know, uh, to be um, frank about it, a lot of these actions are are working around the edges of various programs and finding opportunities within the frameworks that we have to make these types of, of shifts. Um, um, but as others have said before, and I think I've said, I don't know if I've said it today, but in other um, presentations, to really get this done and to see this big shift happen, it'll take a lot more than the uh, funding and a lot more than what our current state programs uh, provide us in terms of an opportunity. Um, you know, I think um, the American Jobs Plan that the Biden administration has has put out there um, is is um you know frankly looks a little bit like cap diet <laughs> in terms of of the federal priorities and 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 uh at least in the transportation um and housing piece as to uh, where we should be focusing so i think that's that's really promising in terms of um and allows um us in california if we adopt this framework and and use it um, with our own work to start prioritizing projects that place us competitively uh, for seeking federal funds um, 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 and also provide a, a pathway for flexible federal funds that come directly to us in terms of what they should be focused on as well. Um, so I think timing wise, the opportunity aligns um, 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 well and and in terms of you know how to kind of uh, quantify and look at uh, at those shifts and and evaluate our success, I, I think, um, you know, it, 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 at this point, you know, this document doesn't do do um, um, a, a whole lot in terms of, of of metrics. This is kind of the first step in terms of setting that framework. Um, um, but you know, we're certainly interested in kind of building upon that, and 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 um, you know, once we kind of have this out there and and can use it to guide our decision making, I think you know. It, uh, hopefully we can we can dig deeper into uh, really kind of quantifying those shifts and, and thinking about uh, what all we need to do to to be a lot more transformative. Yeah, thank you. And and my final thought, I just want to encourage you in this and, and encourage you in this process that, um, you know, change is very hard and it's easy to change a goal. Right. I mean, it, you know, it's easy to say, well, now we're going to do this. But if the underlying things that created the, the the environment we're trying to change. If those don't change, then we're going to get really frustrated because we're not going to see progress. And I, I just think the if we don't start funding things that specifically reduce BMT, then we're never going to reduce BMT. And I know that seems like kind of obvious, but but I and I and I'm not suggesting the implementation of that idea is easy. 
Um, but I, you know, I think once we aligned it, like this is what we have to do and it, it's going to be good. It's going to be good for the environment. It's going to be good for housing costs. It's going to be good for quality of life. It's going to be good for livable, walkable, all the types of things we care about. And it's going to be done in an equitable way. I, I think, I think, uh, Dr. Sperling's comments around, around that piece of, especially associated with transit is, is vitally important. And so, um, I just want to, want to really encourage you, um, as, as you go through this process. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to go now to Director De La Torre, then we're going to go to uh, Director Balms and I mean, Board Member De La Torre and Board Member Balms, and then we are going to go to um, a significant amount of public comment, and then we'll go back if there are other comments from commissioners and board members. Thank you, Chair Norton um, and Supervisor uh, Fletcher. If if you don't get an OK Boomer, you're not trying. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I'm not a, I'm not either, but somehow I got, I, I I've had that thrown in my face. It's like our kids yeah. go to wine, right? Yeah. Kids today. Um, uh, I've got a couple of, uh, issues that I wanted to, to, uh, ask about. Um, the first is on the roadway pricing working group. Um, I know it is politically difficult, uh, but you're calling it out. You're saying we're, this working group is going to come together. Um, I, I think we have to. It's, it's come up indirectly in the conversation today, uh, maybe kind of directly. So uh, when do you anticipate having concrete recommendations for authorizing and implementing pricing strategies? So that's part one. Part two is um, can we, this group, this joint meeting, um, look over the work products and recommendations from the working group uh, whenever they're, you know, ripe. Um, not necessarily at the very end, uh, but at some point so that we can have a robust discussion about these ideas and, and throw them around and, and, and react to them. Uh, everyone knows that from day one of, of these joint meetings, I've been asking for more of an action agenda. And so I think that is a good one for the two uh, groups to, to weigh in on and throw their ideas around and, and, and react in some way. So that's, that's the first part. The second, um, related back to the joint meetings, um, can we, uh, uh, for CAPTI, when the, the, the work is done um, at some point this year, is it possible for us to get uh, uh, have a conversation with CalSTA, with CTC, with CARB, um, and, and the housing uh, uh, department to uh, for staff to work together and put together the list of the actions that um, you know we can we can review and talk about um, from CAPTI. Um, so uh, you know, just uh, is that possible? Can we plug this? the multi-agency effort into um, that process uh, in such a way that, again, we can have deliberation, we can have input, um, and then whether we take action here um, uh, as, at the joint meeting or we go back to our respective uh, agencies and take action there, um, I think it's, it's important that we do that. So those are my two um, multi-part questions. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, board member. Um, uh, in response to your your first question um, around the pricing piece and and timeline around that, all of the actions listed in the document, um, uh, there's a matrix that has short, medium, and long term with a range of of, of years of, of what we expect each one to take. I believe off the top of my head, and so don't quote, quote me on this. I wasn't able to pull it up fast enough, but I believe. Um, the pricing piece is on a, a, a one to two year uh, uh, time frame, um, but there's a lot of urgency around this. So I think you know, we're, we're, uh, that's that's kind of a um, uh, a ballpark, and you know the hope is to get together with and um, uh, bring a coalition of folks together um, who are working on these issues um, and uh, start finding pathways for implementation on uh, as soon as we can. 
Um, and I think a lot of what that looks like and 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 how long it will take um, will will depend on um, uh, kind of commitments that the group can make in terms of, and I expect this to potentially happen in even phases. I don't necessarily expect a work group to to go go away for two years and come back with this big recommendation report. I really see this as maybe a working partnership and relationship with our local and regional um, entities and others uh, to, to get together and set some milestones for themselves of, of what they can accomplish on a rolling basis. So I think one or two years is kind of the overall effort that we see, but um, I would expect outputs out of that much sooner than that. Um, um, uh, so uh, I'm certainly happy to, um, as you uh, suggested, bring back recommendations to this body um, um, in the future as, as, as things come out of that effort. In terms of, um, you know, uh, involving the joint body in the specific actions moving um, um, uh, forward, you know, I think uh, Kels is certainly happy to, to work with you all to, to um, to involve you all um, in, in whatever capacity you'd like to be um, involved in that process. I think um, we have we currently have an interagency uh, working group going that includes um, all three of the agencies represented here, which we're going to be using as our um, uh, implementation working group as well to to uh, you know essentially have assigned leads responsible for the different actions of the different agencies, do regular check-ins and reporting out to them, lead to what we've committed to you all as an annual report to you on um, on um, implementation of those pieces. But certainly happy to accommodate any additional um, uh, input or involvement um, um, that you all um, as a collective body would like us to, to engage you on. Thank you, Darwin. Um, I'm going to call on um, board member Balms next. Thank you, Chair Norton. Um, so I'll try to be brief because we want to hear from the public. Uh, and I uh, want to go back to the VMT reduction discussion that Dr. Sperling started with, uh, started us on. And he mentioned the economic and environmental benefits of reducing VMTs and kind of didn't really emphasize the health benefits. And, and again, when uh, Supervisor Fletcher uh, gave his eloquent uh, on the ground experience about trying to reduce VMTs. He again talked about even he got to quality of life, but he didn't talk about health. And I just want to say, as the public health member of the uh, Air Resources Board, there's a lot of health benefit to active transportation. Uh, Commissioner Guardino uh, alluded to getting back on his bike again after the pandemic. But active transportation, in addition to reducing VMTs, uh, active commuting has a tremendous health benefit that's quantifiable. There's a whole literature, and CARB is actually uh, working to quantify the health benefits of increased active transportation as part of our uh, health benefits of this new scoping plan that we're coming up with for uh, AB32 implementation. So I would really encourage. Uh, transportation planning, to, and I think you're, you're starting to do this, to have a health um, lens in addition to the, the other lenses that you use for transportation planning, to have a health lens. And, you know, I, for one, I'm happy to help in that regard. Uh, but I think it's just like we have to have an equity lens on everything we do, we really have to have a health benefit uh, lens on everything we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Justin, I'd like to open it up to um, public comment. And then I know we have other commission members who want to speak So, and board members. So could you open up the public comment? And then could we start the three minute clock with public commenters? Thank you, Chair Norton. Up uh, first, we have Ray Trainer. Thank you, uh, Chair Norton and Chair Randolph. It's really a pleasure to spend some time with you this afternoon. My name is Ray Trainer. I'm the Chief Planning and Innovation Officer with uh, SANDAG. And the, uh, the draft cap die that was presented by Deputy Secretary Musabi directly aligns with everything we're doing in the San Diego region and the work that we're doing to develop the five big moves and our 2021 regional plan. We think that building a multimodal system that's going to help us better move people, goods, 
is going to really help us achieve equity, mobility, and environmental and economic goals that we've established in our region. I'm just really excited about the conversation today. We think it's so fitting that you three agencies are actually meeting together to consider the draft cap die. And then even this conversation this morning where there was this discussion about the need for cross-agency cooperation to really advance electric vehicles, I think it just illustrates how important the state and regional partnerships are. And we think that the cap die builds on that kind of model of collaboration that you were talking about this morning. And so we think really to be successful, it's absolutely critical that we not only speak with one voice, but that we actually move in the same direction. And we think the cap die is going to be a challenge for all of us. We know that, but everyday regions like ours, we have to make really tough decisions. We've got to figure how we can balance what was promised in the past and at the same time, we recognize that we know, uh, you know, we've got a better future ahead of us and we just can't afford to put off any longer what we should have been doing years ago. So we believe we've got the data. We should, we've got to use it. We've got to figure out, and you know, how we can make this system better. And I think if we can learn anything from the pandemic, which has been completely ca catastrophic for many of our members of our community, it's just revealed that there's cracks in the current transportation system. And so this just gives us an opportunity to really rethink our approach, rethink our planning, and the time is now to really put this into place. So I just wanna encourage this joint body and all of the colleagues at the other MPOs throughout the state to support the implementation of the CAP Day. We think it's the right thing for, for California, and we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to participate this afternoon, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next public comment. Up next, we have uh, Kiana Valentine. Good afternoon, Madam Chairs and members of uh, the Commission and the Board. Uh, my name is Kiana Valentine. I'm the Executive Director of Transportation California, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition of labor and management organizations, and we represent the transportation industry and workforce that builds, repairs, and maintains our statewide multimodal transportation system. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to provide some comments today and have been listening very intently to all uh, the communication on the draft cap tie, and I think a lot of um, excellent conversation has ensued. Uh, transportation California supports the state's climate, health, and equity goals. And we believe there are many positive aspects to the draft cap tie, including investing in rail, transit, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, strengthening social and racial equity in the transportation planning process, and assessing physical climate risk, just to name a few. At the same time, we are apprehensive about the proposed strategies for achieving cap ties, climate health and equity goals and are genuinely concerned about the next stages of cap tie absent meaningful stakeholder engagement and uh, significant additional information and data. Um, I should say we are appreciative of the future CTC and other workshops that are going to evaluate CAPTI, but the timeline for final completion of the final document hasn't changed, and so it's really unclear to us uh, about the ability to influence the document in the remaining couple of months. Um, while our formal comments will elaborate in much more great uh, much more detail our concerns with the draft cap tie, we wanted to highlight a few key issues for you today. Uh, the first is that support for SB1's fix it first approach in the draft document is not enough. The state must identify and deliver new revenues to solve transportation related climate change, health and equity issues. Um, it has already been discussed uh, S2.4, uh, for instance, suggests uh, first pursuing new federal revenues, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Masavi's uh, recognition that that is the first approach in the draft cap tie to this issue, uh, but it also offers the concept of taking small contributions from across several programs, which we are opposed to. Um, you know, I can't help but remind folks uh, that ATP is not the only oversubscribed program. When SB1 was passed, we only closed half of our maintenance, rehabilitation, and safety needs on the state and local system. We only closed the gap by 50%. Uh, without having seen the most recent numbers, I would argue there is still tens of billions of dollars in backlog on the existing transportation system, which is so critical uh, to our quality of life and um, economy in the state of California. 
I see I have 10 seconds left, so I'm going to have to conclude my remarks and save my other comments um, for our letter, but look forward to continued conversation on this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Kiana. Appreciate it. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Kurt Brocky. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Kurt Brotke, OCTA's Director of Strategic Planning. So I'm speaking to you today as a uh, planning and implementation agency. So our agency plans, funds, we deliver uh, many transportation solutions for over 3 million residents of Orange County, uh, over a million employees, and over 45 million annual visitors. And our efforts in that regard are shaped by SCAG's regional transportation plan that targets reducing uh, GHG uh, emissions between now and 2045. Uh, so we have a full plate uh, that uh, is required to really get us there. And so today we are the primary bus transit provider uh, throughout Orange County. We own the Los San Corridor in Orange County. We provide operating assistance to Metrolink. We're the managing agency for the Pacific Surfliner Corridor, which covers much of California. And even right now, we're building a streetcar project in Central County that will improve access to uh, that disadvantaged community. In addition, we own and operate the 91 Express Lanes uh, that connects the, to the Inland Empire. And we're building one of the largest Express Lane uh, projects in the US right now on the 405 Corridor. We're also a funding agency uh, to many agencies, including Caltrans. Uh, and cities, and much of that funding goes into new bikeways, signal upgrades, and water quality improvements. We definitely want to do more, and we've made commitments uh, in the RTP to do that. And so we do need um, additional investment. <clears throat> so we have three comments as it relates to the CAPTI. Uh, the first is that we're concerned that portions of the plan may reduce our flexibility to compete for SB1 funding for committed RTP projects that reduce vehicular delays improve air quality and move us forward with meeting those uh, GHG goals. There are some projects that may include uh, eliminating system choke points and bottlenecks that really allow vehicles, including trucks and buses, to move more efficiently through our roadway system. Uh, at the same time, we're encouraged by many of the elements in CAPTI related to the support it lends to transit capital, uh, particularly zero emission bus, uh, bike and pedestrian improvements and passenger rail. So we thank you for your efforts in that regard. Um, we would also note CAPTI does not include anything related to long-term transit operating costs. Uh, and that uh, is a challenge for an agency such uh, as ours. And then finally, we're supportive of many of the comments that have been made uh, related to including additional stakeholders from the business community, construction uh, trades, <clears throat> and especially that portion of the workforce that travels long distances to access uh, well-paying jobs. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much and way to get to that time limit. Um, our next speaker. Up next, we have Will Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Will Barrett again with the American Lung Association. And uh, wanted to start off by just saying how much we appreciate the ongoing dialogue between state agencies here today. Um, and also for the significant, uh, very significant outreach that CALSTA has made to stakeholders to inform the CAPTI process. We've uh, been looking forward to the uh, final uh, product coming forward and believe that uh, we need to move as quickly as possible to implement Executive Order N1919 that was issued over 19, uh, basically 18 months ago now. Uh, the Lung Association, we're placing a heavy focus on the CAPTI through the lens of improving health and air quality for all Californians. Ultimately, this is a very important process. There's strong language related to improving and protecting public health, and especially in our most disadvantaged communities as a frame for transportation investments. This is a long overdue shift. We greatly appreciate, again, that these issues are central to the CAPTI development. Um, to Dr. Sperling's point earlier, uh, we are at a crossroads, and the CAPTI really provides a critical opportunity to align investment with healthier transportation uh, systems, cleaner air for all, and a more sustainable California. Or we can you know, ignore the plan and lose that opportunity that has been presented. So ultimately, we're fully supportive of moving the CAPTI process forward with an eye towards implementation. Some of the key items uh, for implementation that I just wanted to note quickly 
really are, we want to see the state agencies implementing this framework to shift investments to VMT or reducing policies and projects. Uh, we want to see healthier, more active transportation modes invested in and supported. And again, uh, the, the focus on zero emission technologies and infrastructure that are included in the plan, both for light duty and the freight sector. Um, the CAPTI process should also help inform CARB's mobile source strategy and the upcoming scoping plan that are geared towards attaining our clean air and climate standards to protect public health. So I want to see that uh, built into you know, the, the, the CARB you know, processes as well. Uh, we think the CTC should uh, begin now uh, to work on updating project guidelines to ensure the public health equity and other state interests are reflected in the project selection process that they go through. Um, we know that what's in the CAPTI is still in development, but I think it's important for those guidelines to be updated as quickly as possible. Um, also think that current uh, pipeline projects, future projects, um, under all agencies' jurisdictions should be reviewed for consistency with the CAPTI, a vision for healthier communities and equitable communities, and really bring more programs into this frame uh, that CAPTI has laid out. And my last note, uh, as I mentioned this morning, and as Dr. Baums just referenced, uh, we really feel like the uh, all state agency decisions should be run through a robust public health benefit analysis. And I think that the public health working group is a critical opportunity in a few weeks to discuss this project through that lens. And I think that they should be included in uh, as a key player in implementation of the CAPTI. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Jennifer Ward. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair and members of all of the boards and commissions today. My, again, my name is Jennifer Ward and I'm the Senior Vice President of Advocacy for the Orange County Business Council. And just first of all, I wanted to thank CTC and CalSTA for responding to our previous comments by OCBC along with 29 other business and industry representatives from across the state requesting additional and more dedicated engagement as you've conducted with other key stakeholders. So we appreciate you adding um, two additional workshops on the CAPTI in April and we'll look forward to participating and providing more substantive feedback through that process and just definitely hope to work with your offices to ensure that the is issues raised by us as key drivers of California's economy can actually be incorporated and reflected in this plan. Um, you know, in particular, better analyzing and identifying the economic workforce and industry impacts of the strategies outlined in the plan and how these will be funded, um, as others have mentioned already, um, especially in light of the way the pandemic has, has changed economic activity as well as more clarity on how these strategies interface with the state's need to just really make a dent in our significant backlog and housing supply. So again, you know, look forward to a more robust discussion and, and collaboration with the business community on this plan, and we'll be following up with uh, additional comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, next public comment. Up next, we have Anna Moneymaker. Good afternoon, directors, uh, commissioners, and Mr. Velasquez. I'm Anna Moneymaker with LA Metro. We appreciate you taking the time to review the draft CAPTI and consider our comments on it. Our board supports the governor's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as we're currently engaged in the most aggressive expansion of a transit system in the country and are committed to implementing Measure R and M funds with the state as a partner. First and foremost, we are very pleased to see several welcomed updates to the preliminary draft plan materials that were released in March. We appreciate the inclusion of vitally important funding for zero emission public transit vehicles as part of a statewide fleet transition. This funding, together with eligible funding for charging infrastructure, will help advance LA Metro's initiative to convert our fleet of over 2,400 buses to zero emissions by 2030. Every electric vehicle we put on our streets today means a seizing of emissions and we remain fully committed to cleaner transportation options and a better quality of life for all Angelinos. We also want to complement efforts and success in identifying some of the ways that equity must be directly addressed within the actual strategies of the plan. Metro supports policies and programs that reflect principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Through these and other efforts, transportation systems have the potential to achieve their intended purpose, to provide safe and equitable 
access to opportunity, and truly enhance quality of life. This movement remains an area where LA Metro would like to see additional updates to create a more comprehensive and effective plan to reduce climate impacts in the near term. This is something we're working on with local stakeholders as they manage the movement of 40% of our nation's container, um, tr container traffic moving through our region. A main focus of such planning is the major steps needed to improve the air quality, public health, as mentioned by Dr. Liu this morning, and equity as soon as possible for disadvantaged communities in our area to enable funding to replace diesel trucks with near zero low NOx trucks immediately. COVID-19 research showed that exposure to diesel truck emissions, such as particulate matter, uh, created higher rates of morbidity for people afflicted with COVID. And this is just one example of the current injustice and the need to address it. Now on the highway side, LA Metro is following the potential introduction of a vehicle miles traveled bank with interest. Uh, regarding managed lanes, we appreciate the recognition of uh, the importance of roadway improvements that increase bus speed and produce revenue to support VMT reducing modes of transportation. We recommend that these facilities be recognized as supporting person throughput and encouraging commuters to opt out of congestion. We plan to submit our full comments on CAPTI following additional engagement with our stakeholders and board. And once the plan is adopted, we look forward to working with the CTC to implement the plan as we know you will bring your expertise and um, collaborative style to the process. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Kami Peer. Hello, my name is Cami Pierce speaking on behalf of NextGen California. Thank you all for today's presentation and the opportunity to comment on the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. This plan is an integral step toward the state's ambitious climate goals, and we're so excited to see it evolve into an actionable, measurable strategy. Our ability to mitigate and adapt to the damaging effects of climate change worsens every year uh, that we do not act. Therefore, NextGen asks that this important plan is not delayed any longer. SB 375 has not brought us where we need to be for effective climate solutions. We need to adopt strategies like those articulated in CAPTI immediately to deliver on these goals. For these reasons, NextGen California calls on the acting agencies to consider including progress reports and metrics to track spending and the expected greenhouse gas reductions related to these investments. So it's critical that transportation spending projects report on the associated BMT reductions, which programs are being funded, and which actors are accountable for implementation. NextGen California is strongly supportive of including investments in light, medium, and heavy duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure to support the transition to ZEVs everywhere. And we must also think realistically about how our past and present decisions about other forms of infrastructure including how we choose to allocate space for cars or other forms of transportation, how that affects equity and our ability to meet our climate targets. So CAPTI is an important beginning to this overdue discussion and we urge the commission to adopt its recommendations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Martin Watts. Good morning or good afternoon, I'm sorry, Chair and uh, other state participants. On behalf of the Riverside County Transportation Commission, I really appreciate the opportunity to provide some commentary on the Climate Action Plan. I've listened through this entire presentation uh, throughout the day and Riverside County Transportation Commission, like OCTC before us, is a, a planning, funding and project delivery entity. While we do not disagree with the goals outlined in CAPTI, we do have concerns that each region does have their own unique transportation needs. I do appreciate uh, Mr. Musavi's comments on the one size fits all approach, but in Riverside County, we have had experience play out detrimentally to us in the form of the GGRF based AHSC program, where it's designed to not allow us to compete, let alone compete on an equal level. So. We are deeply concerned. We look forward to continuing to work with you. And we do ask that the um, agency and uh, state, uh, state organizations work with us to understand how best to help this plan succeed within our region. And I thank you again. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. 
Up next, we have Naila Pope Harden. Hi, Naila. Thank you for presenting public comments today. There we go. Thank you for having me. Um, Naila Pope Harden with Climate Plan. Um, I am so happy to hear the robust conversation that's happening around CAPTI. Um, it is it's exciting to see the three agencies trying to come together and grapple with some of the biggest issues that are facing our state and honestly the world. Um, Climate Planet, many of our partners have been involved in the conversation around CAPTI and many of the groups in our network are very excited about CAPTI being a path forward, but want to reiterate that this is really the bare minimum and just the beginning. Um, we would actually love to see CAPTI being pushed further to linking these strategies to GHG reduction, VMT targets, and accountability from different agencies and including progress reports and tracking of spending, um, just to name a few things. But all of those things should not stop us from moving this plan forward today. Um, as has been said before, this is a living document and we can walk and talk. We need to move this plan forward. We need to start um, implementing the strategies as we can. And as we need to, if we need to make adjustments, we can do that along the way. So we're Extremely excited to see this conversation moving forward, hear agencies' perspectives, especially the linkage to or the inclusion of equity and health um, in climate infrastructure conversations, and just want to throw our support around behind um, this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, next public comment. Up next, we have Matthew Baker. Good afternoon, all. This is Matthew Baker, Policy Director for Planning and Conservation League. Um, PCL strongly endorses the, the draft plan that CALSTA has put forth. We feel it it represents the, the vision and, and, and framework that we need to meet the challenges ahead in achieving our climate and equity goals in the state. Um, we do. Um, like a lot of the advocacy community, you know, feel that we need to go further and would like to see um, further actions uh, identified in specificity and, and particularly accountability measures for monitoring our progress going forward. But in recognizing the, the limitation of CALSTA's authority to direct other agencies for what they're supposed to do, we really feel that responsibility lies on the relevant agencies to take uh, that next step in furtherance of this plan. Um, I'm very encouraged um, by the collaborative spirit of the conversation here today, and I hope that continues. We don't want to see after today this plan to, to go on a shelf. And, and we feel that this, you know, particular venue, and the, the three agencies represented here are, are critical to implementation of the plan. And, and we call, <clears throat> on each of your agencies to, to make that commitment here um, in this venue to 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 further collaborate to go back to your respective agencies and and take that one step further and and, and commit to you know adopting a, a a plan for your respective agencies for the the things within your control in furtherance of of the plan's goals and to bring it back to this body for further identified collaboration we we urge you to to make that commitment today without delay and and there's a lot of work uh, ahead and and pcl looks forward to working with your agencies moving forward thank you very much thank you uh, we have four more people slated for public comment uh so justin could you read the next member up next, we have Martin Espinoza. Martin, you're self-muted. You're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. Okay, and until we get that resolved, we'll move on to Julia Randolph. Julia? Hello. Chair Norton and Chair Randolph, um, and good afternoon to our board members and commissioners. Um, I wanted to echo some of the comments made by Naila with Climate Plan and Will with the American Lung Association about this plan um, being the bare minimum 
and you know we're in a climate crisis so we need this now and we should be moving this plan forward with an eye toward implementation. Uh, CAPTI can really create new avenues to reduce public health and economic harms and it can maximize community benefits for disproportionately impacted disadvantaged communities, low-income communities, and communities of color in both urban and rural regions. Um, I also wanted to stress the importance of specific measures within the plan, including developing a zero-emission freight transportation system through one of CAPTI's key actions of mainstreaming zero-emission vehicle infrastructure within the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. Also, um, as discussed today, uh, the importance of shifting funds towards projects in a way that enhances VMT reduction and doesn't promote single occupancy vehicles like it has in the past and instead alternative modes such as biking, walking, and transit because electrification alone will not get us to our climate targets. Um, the CAPTI plan should also inform the upcoming mobile source strategy at the Air Resources Board and the CTC should start updating its guidelines now to evaluate these projects based on GHG emissions, VMT targets, as well as air pollution and health, and prioritize projects based on this. Um, I also want to echo what Matt Baker from PCL said about making or taking about us taking action today, um, all three respective agencies, and collaborate moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. All right, uh, Martin Espinoza. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the Commission. My name is Martin Espinoza, and I'm a representative for the Northern California Carpenters Regional Council. Uh, we oppose this plan for the following reasons. Bridge, bridge widenings and road expansions are a large portion of our membership work and hours. The idea of limiting those types of infrastructure projects has a devastating impact on our membership's ability to secure work and limit the work and opportunities for our signatory contractors throughout Northern California. Impacts to living wage jobs. Uh, the plan does not indicate any strategies or actions for a possible impact. Our membership relies on driving to work each and every day on these roads and highways all throughout Northern California. Unfortunately, they do not have the luxury of working remote or from home. Our concern is that the proposed reduction in vehicle miles traveled by this plan will, uh, this will propose reduced living wage jobs for my membership. Will this, pro will this propose a reduction in, in uh, living wage jobs for my membership? These are the questions that need to be addressed before moving forward. Uh, that being said, we cannot support the CAPD effort at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next public testimony. Up next, we have Chris Wilson. Hi, uh, good afternoon, chair and members, chairs and uh, members. This is Chris Wilson uh, with Los Angeles County Business Federation. Uh, thank you to the moderator for helping me out with uh, WebEx. This is my first time using this. I've always been used to Zoom, so it's I appreciate the patience. But LA BizFed is a uh, alliance and grassroots business organization of over two, 210 business organizations mobilizing a little less than about a, a half a million employers that employ about 4 million people in Los Angeles County. Just wanted to come on and just uh, thank uh, and give a quick shout out to Darwin Musavi for uh, working with our business community and uh, having a workshop. We're looking forward to it on April 27th. And we're looking to the uh, forward to the continuous conversation uh, with uh, CAPTI and the rest of the uh, commission and CALSTA. So also want to echo our support uh, for the CTC requests of $2 billion uh, in ATP funds. And just want to again, just thank you for all your work on this draft. And we look forward to our business community uh, commenting and making sure that our uh, comments are robust, resilient, and uh, and uh, to the point uh, in um, reference to this plan. So thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Chris. And uh, you meant $2 billion in ATP in the surplus funds, yes? Correct, thank you for the clarification, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, next comment. Up next, we have Bryn Lindblad. Hey, Bryn. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Norton, Chair Randolph, and hi, Darwin, good to see you. Um, uh, I just wanna you know, reaffirm, a lot of us out here are pretty hungry um, for a change to the status quo. Um, there's been a real a real imbalance over the decades, right, of, of favoring cars and um, our transit and active transportation networks have suffered. 
um, as a result. Uh, and so, you know, really like the vision that's there in CAPTI. Um, but, you know, as I said, we're, we're hungry for a bit more of, a, of an action plan. Um, and so we'd like to see a few more accountability mechanisms um, built into it. Um, start to define some of the, the next steps and a timeline for when we can hope to see some of those moves made. Um, and then also would love to see some more um, quantifiable targets in there um, that we can measure and, and track and, and try to hold ourselves um, as a state accountable to. Um, lastly is some of um, my uh, coalition mates uh, from Climate Plan and Coalition for Clean Air mentioned, um, would like to see some like a, a, de a defined kind of uh, timeline for when we might get a report back on progress. Um, just want to keep keep transparency and accountability um, as part of this this CAPTI process. Um, we see in a lot of the the plan a lot of um, sort of commitment to to explore different um, possibility areas, but would like to see a little bit more uh, concrete goals, um, things that that we can. We can hopefully uh, set our set our minds to and try to achieve. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bryn. Uh, next public comment. Up next, we have Amber Crabb. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. This is Amber Crabb. I'm the public policy manager at the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to review this forward-thinking plan to advance California's ambitious climate goals. The San Francisco County Transportation Authority is the county's congestion management agency and San Francisco's Transportation Sales Tax Authority. We developed San Francisco's county-led transportation plan, deliver capital projects, and manage the allocation of numerous local funding programs. We strongly support the direction of the draft, draft cap time and see, see strong alignment with our own values and the planning and investment strategies we're pursuing in San Francisco, including looking at an equity forward congestion pricing program in our downtown. We appreciate the proposal to focus existing programs on expenditures that advance climate goals while maintaining commitments to the voters and working concurrently to advance new initiatives and seek the new funding urgently needed to respond to our climate crisis. In particular, we strongly support advancing the TIRCP funding and identifying other resources to support the deployment of zero emission bus and rail transit fleets sooner including vehicles, vessels, and facility upgrades. We also support identifying road pricing and congestion pricing as an important strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and appreciate the proposed first step of establishing a statewide roadway pricing working group. We very much look forward to participating in that effort. We also look forward to partnering with the state to accelerate delivery of electric vehicle infrastructure, key rail projects, including high-speed rail, protected bikeways and walkways, and transit-oriented development. We also hope the state can identify additional ways to focus investments in a way that improves mobility for low-income families and disadvantaged communities. For instance, by prioritizing sites for electric vehicle infrastructure, providing subsidies for electric bicycles, and funding means-based transit fare programs. Thank you, and we look forward to partnering with your agencies on these efforts, and we'll be following up uh, in writing with more detailed comments. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next public comment. Uh, Chair Norton, I see one more attendee indicating they wish to make uh, public comment at this time. Uh, up next, we have Tyler Munzing. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Chairs. Tyler Munzing on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies, California. Um, just very much appreciate the opportunity to comment on the draft CAPTI and the uh, collaborative effort just between agencies demonstrated here today. Uh, ACC California represents over 1,000 engineering firms and 25,000 design professionals in private practice in the state. Um, while we support active transportation and agree with the environmental uh, equity and uh, health goals that are reflected here, uh, we are most interested in those additional quantifiable details. Um, frankly speaking, the reality is that absent new revenues, the state cannot accomplish everything that it wants to do under CAPTI and also everything that voters were promised when they voted to preserve SB1. Uh, this is an effort that will require identifying funding opportunities and a more robust analysis and a discussion that we in the transportation construction design industries are ready and willing to engage in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Justin, does that complete public comment? 
Yes, Sir Norton. I see no other public comment at this time. Okay. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, offer to the commissioners and board members opportunity to make other comments and ask other questions. I know I had gotten in between. I have some questions myself. Um, Phil Cerna, we'll call on you next. I see you. Board Member Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I always get very concerned when uh, we um, have a presentation on uh, something as comprehensive as um, as this uh, cl climate action plan. And we have uh, uh, a number of organizations and individuals that um, are very supportive, but um, when there's uh, one or perhaps two uh, individuals or organizations that are opposed, that's where I really, uh, it piques my interest because I'm very curious to know uh, what the concerns are, um, what the perceived concerns are and what the real real concerns uh, might be. So I, I wanted to ask Darwin if he could respond to um, the some of the concerns that were expressed by the carpenters. Um, you know, one of the one of the key aspects of the draft plan is to uh, focus on um, disadvantaged communities and making sure that whatever investments are going to be pursued, that there is some some direct benefit there. So maybe more broadly, uh, Darwin, you could speak to how there will be an attempt or uh, a very concerted effort to uh, employ locally for various uh, projects based on the, the investment strategy of CapEx. Sorry, I was still on mute there, but um, thank, thank you, um, uh, board member Serna, for that um, um, opportunity to talk about that. Um, you know, specifically um, about the, the the workforce piece. You know, these are we're talking about at least right now. Um, uh, the plan is oriented around existing um, uh, uh, funding programs and existing programs, and we um, haven't, as part of this effort, directly um, um, asked for or suggested additional workforce development related components. Um, in addition to what's existing in those programs. However, you know, I was uh, slightly outside of the, the um, uh, uh, scope of the charge, but, you know, to your point about, about the benefits and disadvantaged community benefits and, and ensuring that, that um, these funds, you know, uh, uh, as they have been and continue to be spent in a way that provide workforce opportunities for folks in those communities. Certainly interested in, in working with you all and, and folks who have been commenting to come up with opportunities where we can strengthen some of that if there's opportunities to do so. Um, um, uh, so uh, any specific comments around that that, that folks have um, you know, through the public comment uh, process, um, um, happy to, to um, incorporate. In terms of, you know, I think some of the, the, the comments um, you know broader comments and and concerns you know i think going back to uh, what we heard earlier in terms of this document being a, a pretty big shift in terms of kind of overall high level policy um you know i think you know i just want to make clear that that um calista and and capta recognize and understand that um there will be continue to be many sectors of the economy that rely on driving um as as a key component um, uh, of our transportation system, and and um, uh, uh, this this document is by by no means saying that that we're moving away from um, from driving, as we've heard from some of the data points and whatnot shared earlier. We have um, um, about two percent of of the state relying on on transit currently, but when you look at our our demographics of of the need there and the cost of driving and our and our uh, the breakdown there there's definitely an imbalance in terms of what we need and drivers can certainly benefit from other users being taken off the road so i do think there's a lot of work we can do to to um uh, talk more about and discuss um with, with folks who um, are concerned about these strategies um uh, around how uh this document's really about creating more options and um, um uh, and is about more and not about taking anything away and i think that's an area of concern that we've heard um, and certainly look forward to engaging in conversations on that and, and seeing how we can clarify and make that um, explicitly clear in our document. 
Yeah, I, I would. I appreciate the response. I, I think moving forward, as as you um, get closer to finalizing uh, the um, the investment uh, strategies, um, I think it would be very helpful um, for you to think carefully about how the intersection of um, job creation, economic development, and uh, especially in communities of color, disadvantaged communities, how you could. Um, uh, not just to spell some of the the, con the the concerns that perhaps you know may be misplaced in terms of you know perceptions that we're trying to do away with cars altogether, but instead um, maybe explain in, in in you know a certain amount of detail how their the investments actually can uh, serve to uh, produce job opportunities in places that are you know job deserts right now um, in disadvantaged communities. I think that's we're really where the tangible benefits going to be uh, felt felt the most, um, and so I'd encourage you to do that as you get closer to a final document. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Randolph. Do you have any comments? Um, I have some uh, closing comments and questions, and um, some input from uh, Executive Director Mitch Weiss. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, circle back to the, uh, I guess, kind of the process question. Um, and this is not necessarily for Darwin, but more for um, for our agency staffs in terms of thinking about, um, you know, what's the best way to continue to stay engaged in this process and, um, and provide feedback um, to uh, to Calsta um, and also to have the opportunity for the kind of interactive discussion um, that we're having this afternoon because uh, I mean so far folks have raised some really great points about kind of um, at what point will the plan be finished and then what are the next steps and how are we going to be um, sort of uh, following up with those next steps, hearing, I know Darwin mentioned uh, some annual uh, reporting, but also thinking about, you know, what are ways that um, CTC and CARB and HCD can continue to um, hear how things are going and provide feedback into the process. So uh, I would really um, encourage our staff to kind of huddle up and think about kind of what are some, some ways that we can uh, specifically kind of put some meat on those bones. Yeah, well, that's a really good segue into the conversation we want to have on the the upcoming workshops. Uh, but before we do that, I did want to ask some questions to Darwin about the idea of growing the pot, um, because I think we've had a lot of conversations, you and I, and beyond about what we can do together, especially because much of this plan was written before we had a federal partner, the likes of which President Biden and, and this Congress. And we have been so excited about the work that we're doing um, in our congressional briefings with um, CalSTA and Caltrans, um, especially along the lines of what we could be doing with TSEP and additional funds to support the work we have both supported on um, expanding opportunities for electrification and expanding the opportunities to have uh, charging along freeways. And so like with the ATP, which we all support looking at um, the uh, surplus for additional funding for ATP, how can we start integrating in where we have been very, very effective at addressing some of the things that are listed in CAPTI that don't involve taking our existing money, but actually are taking advantage of our ability to leverage federal funds in ways very few others have because we are charging our own gas tax increase to have some of these fix it first strategies. And I think about right now, um, well, I went to high school in Washington State and right now Washington State wishes they had an SB1. They are really contending with the fact that they don't and they have such crumbling infrastructure. We have the opportunity to leverage it and really grow um, our ability to go after federal money. So can we talk about how we can grow the um, grow the grid and grow the, the funding sources to be applied to these goals? Certainly, and I think, you know, to, to your uh, uh, point, Chair Norton, I think this is probably, um, you know, was not one of 
Um, the clearest opportunities when this document started being written, but now is probably one of the best opportunities we have to actually put this document to use um, in a meaningful way. Not to say that our actions in here aren't very meaningful, but the scale at which we're talking about in terms of potentially being able to bring in additional investments to some of this of this work, um, I think really changes um, with the um, 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 efforts that the Biden administration has underway. Um, I'll say a, a couple a couple things. You know, I think there's I kind of think of of, of the, the tangible um, impact that new federal funding can have in, in two different ways. One is um, traditional new um, uh, prescribed or flexible funding that we could put towards these uses that are given, whether through uh, formulaic um, uh, uh, um, avenues or additions to existing programs or whatnot, and we're certainly interested in in using the CAPTI framework to help guide uh, the types of things we invest with those projects, and and that can really grow our ability as a state to invest in in um, implementing the framework. And and um, um, but in addition to that, I think then there's the competitive nature of federal programs. Um, that may see an increase of funding um, at the federal level. And as we've already seen, I think the Biden administration um, um, is already adopting um, um, new criteria and perspectives in terms of how they're looking at their own programs and what makes for a competitive uh, project. So as much as um, you know, we can align our, our funds, I think, you know, as we all know, the, the most competitive um, a federal project is the one that has state dollars on it um, um, or local dollars on it. And um, uh, the infra program, for example, that released to NOFO um, a month or so ago added two new criteria. One was around climate, specifically calling out VMT. One was around racial equity. Um, and um, as we fund projects and prioritize our projects around those same criteria, I think it puts us at a competitive advantage to have projects that are at the ready to be able to compete for those federal funds. Um, uh, we haven't talked a lot about this um, here today, but a key aspect of this, and I know this is um, um, uh, not as in, uh, exciting to engage in because it can be longer term, but that's very, very important, is planning and ensuring that we're building um, um, a project pipeline and planning for a project pipeline that aligns with, with the outcomes that we're looking for. You know, a lot of the conversations certainly around funding and what we fund right now, but um, um, uh, I think there's a lot in this document that can also support um, planning, particularly in regions that don't have the resources to do a whole lot of new robust planning themselves using those state resources through Caltrans um, uh, to support um, um, regions and coming up with um, uh, solutions to these these um, transportation problems of the 21st century and positioning those projects to be able to compete for federal dollars, I think will be key. Um, so there's a lot in here that I think, you know, um, syncs up well with with the efforts of the um, Biden administration. And I, I appreciate you bringing up that opportunity. Okay, and um, then the only thing I wanted to ask was about our concerns about making sure that we have this alignment of gas tax to road user charge so that there's no dip in funding because we really do need to make sure that we continue to have these accounts for the jobs and the goals that we fought for with SB1 and fought against in Prop 6 so that we can make sure that we had the money to build these projects. And so how are we being able to look at where the, the base years are and, and what our progress is so that when we address the need for switching from a gas tax to something else, that there's no net loss of funding for all of these infrastructure projects? Yeah, it's a, it's obviously a, a key and critical question, you know, one that also came up this morning in the ZEV conversation. Um, I think as we saw with the ZEV conversation, it's one that um, is is broader than any one of these singular plans. And there are more programs than just the ones listed here that would even potentially be impacted. Um, um, and, uh, you know, so uh, we uh, as, as a result of that, we didn't think that this particular uh, plan that looks at uh, leveraging um, our transportation dollars uh, to prioritize um, prod, you know, specifically projects around climate was the place to talk about the, the long-term 
um, uh, need for for um, for revenue for transportation. However, you know, as you know, it's something that we're um, at Calista very um, um, uh, committed to, and and through our efforts in coordination with you all through the road charge um, effort, something that we we want to partner, continue partnering with you on. I'm happy to to explore if there's if there's um, ways that we can make sure that. And, and I think this might be um, important to make sure that we acknowledge that need within this effort. I think that's 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 important. And then we can certainly talk about um, um, uh, you know those efforts that we're undertaking to address it um, um, at a different time. Thank you, Don. Um, I see that we don't have any more public comment, nor um, co commission or board member comments. I did want to throw this to um, Executive Director Weiss because. Um, Chair Randolph and I had spoken about what we can do in the ways of these joint meetings. And because I'm all of 19 months as uh, a commissioner and Chair Randolph is, is new in her role, could you just define and, and let us know in, in these joint meetings what our capabilities are in terms of actions, et cetera? And then could you also talk a little bit about our um, future workshops and what the format's going to be because I think all of us here within Earshop are going to want to participate. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can touch on both of those very briefly. Um, so uh, th there, uh, first of all, regarding the, the action, um, we've been advised by our council and our understanding is that it's the same with CARB, that this joint format would not be appropriate for, for taking action. Um, you know, it's it's really up to us here to to have these robust conversations like we like we did today, and then take those back and incorporate those in the actions we're doing in the individual bodies. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, nothing has been noticed for uh, action, so uh, you know, that would be a a, a significant second very significant barrier to taking action. Um, regarding uh, the the CAPTI workshops that have been mentioned uh, previously. Um, we, in conjunction with Caltrans and Calsta, are holding two workshops on April 20th and 23rd, both in the afternoon. Uh, they'll be using this the same format uh, that uh, everybody loves. This, you know, I don't know what it is. We're go go to webinar. Yes, that's the one we're using today. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, our our goal is to try to to, to go through some of the. Uh, strategies that are laid out in the first half of the document in on, on our first workshop in the second half on, on the second half um, we're um, going to be noticing these because we expect we'll have a quorum of commissioners there but these won't be uh help run like a commission meeting it'll be a staff run workshop yes and those can, workshops can are I ask a other, with other uh agencies correct i mean cgc will run it but there are other agencies participating is that correct? yes yes we'll, we'll be coordinating with with calsta and caltrans chair randall i'm sorry to interrupt i just wanted to ask a clarifying question um so uh, i understand um you know this meeting is is definitely not uh noticed for any action um and uh, I just wasn't sure that, you know, whether or not um, in the future there might be opportunities to structure um, uh, uh, actual notice and, and, and um, a, a format that, that would lend itself to that. And that's not something we necessarily have to address today, but um, I would certainly encourage our staffs maybe to get together and kind of have that conversation. Um, because you know it could be any range of things it could just be some some sort of uh kind of high level direction to staff about things to think about between uh, you know before the next meeting or or um it could it could even be some kind of sort of um noticed uh kind of uh joint um kind of statement in support of something or i mean it seems like there there could be any number of of options so long as they were consistent with both the bagley keen act and with um, whatever the operating rules for each of our agencies is so i guess i just kind of wanted to encourage that conversation to kind of continue to think about uh, what uh, opportunities there might be uh, potentially in the future for good uh, good coordination and uh, good direction thank you we'll, we'll, we, we'd be happy to continue that yes and I did want to say that this has been 
an ongoing process of, of greater and greater collaboration as we continue our work together. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of the participants really engaging deeply in these conversations. Darwin, you've been a champ um, standing here for like two hours now, nearly three. And uh, so Mitch, I did want to make sure that before we left that we did go through a little bit of what we have been able to accomplish together and a little bit of the agency updates and then um, to thank everyone and, and we will adjourn. Uh, yes, and well, and in the interest in, in making sure that uh, that people get to dinner on time, I will make my uh, my presentation very brief. Um, uh, first of all, um, this has been this has been very exciting. I, I really enjoyed the robust conversations that we've had. Um, and as uh, Sharon Orton mentioned, <laughs> thanks to my team there, I will not be that brief. Um, I'll, I'll be presenting on behalf of uh, CTC, HCD, and CARB staff, just giving a, a very quick update on some of the things focusing on what we've uh, done since our last joint meeting. Um, uh, first of all, as uh, D Director Velasquez, Velasquez mentioned, um, they're in the final stages of adopting regulations for their pro-housing designation program. The regulations will be used to promote, evaluate, and incentivize housing support of local policies. Uh, yeah, at our last meeting, uh, we had Dr. Karen Chappelle present to us 16 recommendations for state housing, climate, and transportation policy. And our, our staffs are working together uh, to look at those, analyze those, and, and figure out how we, might, how we might possibly implement those in the, in the future. Um, we, we talked about the importance of incorporating equity in our, our decision-making uh, at, at that meeting, our last meeting, and I want to just highlight quickly a few things that we've done. Um, first, that the commission adopted a racial e racial uh, equity statement in January, and we've uh, refocused the vacant position to focus on equity and public engagement. And uh, I look forward to being able to announce our new team member very, very, very shortly. Uh, on that same note, in January, uh, Chanel Fletcher was appointed to the position of deputy executive officer of environmental justice at CARB. And prior to joining CARB, Chanel served as executive director of Climate Plan, a nonprofit organization focused on advancing policies and programs to realize more sustainable and equitable development throughout California. Um, I, I'd like to recognize uh, some of HCD's work to combat housing discrimination and foster inclusive communities for all. This has been enhanced by mandates under AB 686 for public agencies to affirmatively further, further fair housing in all housing and community development programs and activities. And they'll be working in the coming year with uh, public agencies to meet these new requirements. And between these meetings, we've really continued to improve our coordination uh, as uh, staffs to, to reach the common goals that we all have. Uh, some of those, the formats that we've uh, coordinated include uh, work groups such as the housing and uh, transportation coordination work group, state agency MPO work group, interagency resiliency work group, CAPTI interagency work group, SEV market development strategy work group. Clearly, we're really good at work groups. Um, <laughs> yeah, these, uh, yeah. And, and as agencies, we, these efforts really rely heavily on uh, public feedback and input. And we work hard to prioritize opportunities for public engagement. These venues really provide an important pathway for implementing the concepts and ideas we discuss at our joint meetings. Um, you know, and our, our teams have also worked on, on a number of uh, guideline development areas in, in programs and in some cases on uh, evaluations of projects. These include the active transportation program, the solutions for congested corridors program, local partnership program, trade corridor enhancement program, transit and inner city rail program, and the sustainable transportation equity project. And we look forward to in the coming years uh, expanding and deepening this coordination as we move to more funding and try to grapple uh, with some of the issues that we've discussed today. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm stopping here, boss. <laughs> you want to run out the clock? Um, thank you very much, Executive Director Weiss. Um, Chair Randolph, do you have any closing words for us today? 
Uh, no, I, I think I, I think I covered it um, in terms of thinking about our our next steps. Um, and uh, and again, want to thank everyone for a really really great discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have no public comment under public comment. So uh, I want to thank you all, everyone who came as a commissioner, a board member, a presenter, and the public. The best parts of these joint meetings are for us to think through things together and to make sure that everybody hears that these are the things weighing on our minds. You can see that um, electric vehicles have touched a lot of different areas of the state as well as CAPDI and so it's important to think out loud together and I just want to thank uh, Chair Randolph and Director Velasquez and all of our teams for making sure that we are coming together in a spirit of cooperation and conversation so that we can really hear each other and and build a better state together. Thank you very much and with that our meeting is adjourned.